entertaining, informative, and educational. Inspiring content that makes a difference. This is the Maximus Choi Publications Broadcasting Network. Join the Academy. chickens. I don't know what a bad chicken looks like anymore. Okay, welcome to another episode of Bread to Perfection. I'm Kenny Troiano, and today I'm here with my clean-shaven Frank Bradley. Hey, buddy. Huh? How's it going? I'm doing good. How are you? Feel better to get this, uh, fur off my face i tell you you know it's like i was saying yesterday when you commented on my post on facebook um i go from late october till about this time but as long as the temperatures are in the cold and we're still having frost and everything's freezing i like that beard especially when i'm out on the chicken yard but now once it goes above 50 it's got to come off i can't stand it in the heat i really can't i i can barely stand this tell you the truth it gets I have, tough. I have it mostly because Nancy wants me to have it because I'd have it shaved off by now. I can't. Sometimes I can't stand it. But I keep it Here, fairly short. Here's the best one. I went in and shaved both sides of my face. Okay, <laughs> both sides, and left one little streak, one patch here. So I walk out of the bathroom into the bedroom. Amanda's sitting there watching television, and I walk in. And I said, "What do you think?" She looks at me and she goes, "What?" And I say. <laughs> I turned my head. She looked the way I was looking. I turned this way, you know, trying to get her to see that I'd shaved. She looks that way and she goes, what? What is it? And I said, no hair. And then, oh, wow. She didn't even notice. One day I shaved and didn't say anything. And it took her about, uh, I don't know, four or five hours to notice that I'd actually shaved. I uh, I shaved one time and uh, went around my girls and they spent the whole day kind of staring at me kind of strange. And I was like, what? She goes, you just look different. I don't, you don't look like the same person. They, it was almost like they felt uncomfortable around me, you know? So <laughs> that's the way she was pretty much. Yeah. You know, I don't know how many people saw it last week. I think it was last week. We we're talking about Frank uh, creating his arc, you know, because he was uh, having a lot of rain and everything. And uh, we were having a lot of rain here to the point where it was starting to flood around here. I mean, it was like nonstop. So I, I contacted Frank. And I said, you know, I shouldn't complain, but it seems like uh, the rain's going to, it's not going to stop. We're rain, it's raining all day long and I may need an arc of my own. And he goes, uh, you need to be, you need me to float on over there and pick you up. And I says, I'll keep you up to date. You know, um, how fast do you think you can get here? Cause I don't think it's going to stop type of thing. And he says, it depends on the wind. It might take some time next year. So I said, you better start now. Better get on that boat and get on over here so uh that's how it kind of felt because uh i haven't seen that kind of rain in a long time here yeah oh well, last night i was telling you uh, it just you know yesterday was 80 over 80 degrees 81 82 degrees it was beautiful and uh, just like uh, uh steve said what happened to the t-shirt frank so that's what happened to the t-shirt it's 48 today it's 48 degrees today. you guys have w really weird extremes you know it goes from one temperature completely to another. And uh, I've never seen that before. Yeah. And you know, the thing about it is uh, it's hard enough for us to kind of adapt to the weather when it's doing that, but uh, mm -hmm. with our birds, even uh, sometimes it takes a toll on them, especially if you've got a bird that you've got, say for instance, you brought one, I brought one of your birds on my farm and put it there. You know, I think they'd have a hard time the first year, just climatizing, you know, getting to it. And I think a lot of people, when they get birds from other places, they're not taking that, you know, consideration that, you know, 
put us put ourselves in there. Bring you know you out here and let let you and Nancy live out here for a while. It takes a, a good year or maybe even longer to just mm-hmm. kind of get with the groove, you know. Yeah, well, it's weird here. I don't know if it's all of California. I just know it's Ramona. We go from summer to winter. Okay, <laughs> we kind of skip fall. It's like if we have fall, it was maybe for a week, you know, and that's it. And there's times when we go from winter to summer where we have wow. not much of a, it seems like it's wet, rainy, windy, and then all of a sudden it's warm. You know, it's like spring is sometimes so short, the actual, you know, spring temperatures. And every now, every now and then we'll get it. We're like, wow, this is kind of great. I wish it was like this all the time. So, but, um, you know, you might, some of you might notice by now that uh, we're not on Facebook, we're not on Twitter, we're not on some of the other um, social media platforms, only for the reason that we think it's easier to do it all on um, YouTube. Uh, We hope everybody gets with the program and joins us on YouTube. To us, it's better overall. Nancy's always complained that she can't keep up with the chat because some of you guys are on YouTube and some of you guys are on Facebook and facebook doesn't really show who they are so i don't know if i'm talking to a member or not you know it's just easier to do it all in one place that's that's, i mean i've been threatening this for a while that we're going to do it so i was talking to nancy she says yeah let's just go ahead and do that so we're going to be on youtube from now on we're not going to do um you know facebook and twitter and all that kind of stuff i think it'd be better overall so i do too yeah um you know frank we had a good time on uh the uh, members Q and a the other day, you know, we we put out some really good information and uh, pretty much had a steady flow of questions for a good hour and a half, you know, which was, it was kind of fun. Lots of laughs. You know, we have a good time with the members and everything. And I think next time we'll probably do it sometime at the end of the month. And I I know I should have talked to you about it. We have to schedule it still, but um, I don't want, the members live thing to always be the Q and a we talked about doing classes and I thought the best way to probably do the class is just go ahead and do the master's class video. Why don't we just do that? You know what I mean? And so we'll be doing that. um, Sometime. I think the last week, like we normally do, if Frank's um, schedule is open, we'll schedule one for the end of this month and do um, a master's class video. And I think that'll be really good. I think we're going to do it on stage two of the founders program. Just don't say what that is. Okay. (laughs) You know, so. Yeah. Uh, You know, that's what was so great, Kenny, about doing the, the, the members Q and a, and what made it so fun that we actually got to, to use our breeding muscles in those episodes, you know, it, 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 it's so great to be able to, to actually talk breeding with no barriers so to speak, you know, uh, I think that's what made it so fun, but shoot, we was even at one time talking about Bigfoot stuff. You know, we, had, well, <laughs> us and the members, we yeah. was talking about Bigfoot stuff. So, you know, we, we just had, you know, we were serious about the teaching, the questions, but you know, we had fun too. And that, that that's what made it r- r- really enjoyable for me. And I, and I think it did you too. Oh yeah. We went down a total we went off the cliff on that one, you know, I don't know how we got there, but we started talking about Bigfoot and what surprised me is the members were actually, you know, coming in and talking about it too. And everything it was like, how did we get here? But uh, it was kind of fun. We were talking, we were teasing Frank because I had created that banner where he was building his arc. And we said, Nancy goes, we need to uh, create a banner that where he's um, already on the arc. He's going down the ocean. Uh, Jaws is following behind, dragging those barrels, and Bigfoot standing behind him on the helm, holding his hand over his shoulder like that. You know, <laughs> so I go, I never, I was thinking about putting it together for this show, but I never got around to it. You know, well, well you know, we accused we we accused Derek of listening in on us on the back show with oh, yeah, uh, right. uh, with the questions he was asked. I mean, he was spot on yeah, was. with what we was talking about. Yeah. But uh, uh, Kenny was mentioning the Bigfoot. And I swear I said, I wish we'd have had it for where we could show them what we was talking about. But uh, I sent Kenny and actually I posted it on my, my Facebook page. Uh, it was the arc and it had two clouds coming out of it. And one said, uh, did we get two Sasquatches? And the other one goes, I don't know. Oh, yeah. I haven't seen them. And, you know, that was perfect for, you know, what we was talking about in the Q&A for the members. It's on my week. Facebook if anybody wants to see it, you know. It's great. I, yeah, it was pretty good. So, um 
Make sure to uh, sign up for our Breeders Bulletin, which is our version of the newsletter. Just go to www.breedersacademy.com. You're going to get a lot of new bonuses. So if you have you were getting it at one time and you're not getting it anymore, I would tell you to go in there and uh, re-sign up to make sure you're getting it because we got a lot of new bonus material and a lot of new opportunities I think you guys are going to enjoy. I don't want to say what they are now. But it's uh, exclusive to the uh, newsletter or the Breeders Bulletin subscribers. But you are going to get some free tips, free ebooks, notifications, and announcements. So make sure to do that. Um, it's probably what I'm going to be pro promoting the most of here pretty soon is that newsletter. So make sure to join up. Um, what else? I thought I had another announcement. So. Um, anything you want to say before we go into advertisement and then we'll go into the show and start talking about I'm, the subject of the day? I'm ready to get into it, buddy. Okay. I'll be right back. This show is brought to you by the Breeders Academy, where we will help you to increase your knowledge of breeding, advance your skills as a breeder, and help you to improve the quality and performance of your fowl. As a member, I'll provide you a roadmap that you will need to create a true family restraint. Starting with a cock from one breeder and a hen from another breeder, no problem. We can help you to turn your flock of hybrid crosses or mongrels into a pure family restraint and show you how to continually improve that strain each generation. We'll start by showing you how to select your seed fowl and how to turn that seed fowl into a high quality foundation strain. Our proven breeding programs and specialty courses are designed to take you step-by-step -step through the breeding process. And best of all, I'll be there to help you every step of the way. We urge you to check it out. You have nothing to lose, and you can cancel at any time. You also have a 30-day money-back guarantee. Simply go to www.breedersacademy.com to sign up. The Breeders Academy will not only change the way you think about breeding, but improve the way you breed your fowl. Okay, so just so you know, we are opening the doors for the Breeders Academy on March 20th, which is the first day of spring. Uh, so make sure to stand by for that. We're only going to have the doors open for maybe a week or two. So make sure uh, you put that in your calendars and be ready to sign up as soon as I, uh, I'll let you know on the show prior to that, unless for some reason we don't have a show and uh, just be ready for it. A lot of people have been asking me when they can join. Uh, that's when we're going to open the doors. And after that, I have no idea when we're going to open again, just so you know. But um, so today, you know, we're going to continue the series on multiplier or breeder versus multiplier. And I think we're on part five this time. I think it was last week we talked about, what was it? Oh, how great breeders, they breed on purpose and they do very specific matings and things like that. But today we're going to talk about how great breeders maintain a zero defect policy. And this is something we talk about quite a bit. We've even covered this topic a number of times, but um, I think it's a good time to revisit it. And I think it has a lot to do and very relatable to what we're talking about today, which is uh, breeders and multipliers. So anything you want to say before we jump into that, Frank? Let's get to it, buddy. Okay, good. So part of breeding on purpose is maintaining a zero defect policy because you can't really create a strain if you're catering to those kind of faults. Uh, eventually, they're going to take over your strain. But Frank, a lot of people don't know that it starts right from the egg. Yeah. You know, we was talking in the green room before this, and I think it was uh, 2014, 2015. I wrote just a little short clip about, you know, a good breeder would start selecting and culling right with the egg. And right off the bat, I got attacked because I was having people tell me, you know, well, the, the long, the elongated eggs, the sharp elongated eggs are stags, the rounded eggs are pullets, and, you know, just a bunch of, just wife's tail stuff. So I seen right then and there, you know, I wasn't going to be able to do that without being attacked. So uh, a lot of people do doesn't, doesn't see it that way. A good breeder does, but uh, you know, your average backyard breeder, they really don't see that, you know, a small egg is a small chick. A small chick is a weak chick of, uh, 
but you're you're right. That's exactly where you start with is is the eggs, and even when the eggs hatch, even the chicks. And uh, a lot of times that depends on the age of the hen. Okay, right. so like Frank said, you got to start by looking at the the size of the egg, the shape of the egg, um, the quality of the egg. You'll see that once they get to you know closer to maturity, that they're gonna their egg is like their fingerprint. Each hen has a different shape egg. And so, I mean, if you look in the nest box and you see one's a little misshapen or a little smaller than maybe the rest of them, then you just toss that egg out. But if you go in there and that hen's laying all perfectly round eggs, <laughs> there's no shape to it whatsoever, or they look like elongated dinosaur eggs, then you got a problem, <laughs> you know, because typically those kind of eggs don't hatch. Okay. Or if she could be a hen that just typically lays, smaller eggs than she should you know even at maturity i've seen hens that lay look what look like pullet eggs yeah. you know and like frank says though sometimes the uh the size of the egg can have a detrimental effect on the size of the baby chick some chicks tend to you know never kind of get bigger than the egg allowed them to and they always kind of are held back and some chicks will make up that difference but i i find it's better to make up that difference from a mature hen than a pullet. So the shape of the egg, the size of the egg and the quality of the egg is really important, Frank. Yeah. And you, you said it right there, Kenny, uh, I'd rather a chick start off on top and, and stay that way throughout its life to the maturity rather than being behind and having to catch up. There's always variables there because what if there's other variables? you add other things into it, like nutrition environment, uh, it's already behind the eight ball, so to speak. So you start putting other obstacles in its way that that bird's more than likely a 90% chance that it's never going to reach its full potential. Yeah. And one of the things I want to mention too, before we move on is that the quality egg is important because if it's a thin shelled egg, a lot of times the hen gets in there and she breaks it getting in and out of the thing. And then she soils all the other eggs. And uh, that's an indication that either the hen has an issue could be a poor bone density. She does draw some of the calcium from her bones or you just not her feed or nutrition's in def, you know, deficient. Okay. So um, I had that problem, like, I think it was a couple of years ago where I had some pens where the hens were just breaking all their eggs uh, or they were soiling all their eggs. So I had to go in and uh, I don't like, I'm one of those guys who don't like to give the extra calcium unless I feel like they need it. Okay, so I'm always looking at the eggs. It's not something like I always give them grit and everything, but to actually give them the calcium, I'll check out the eggs. And if I feel, if I'm cracking the eggs open and they're tough, you know, then I'm seeing what I need to see. Now I may give some calcium when I start getting close to the molt or even coming out of the molt, but because there's a lot that goes on during the molt and replenishing bone and all that. But typically, I don't typically. Okay, I don't typically give them calcium just to give them calcium. But if I start seeing a problem, then I'll give them calcium. Yeah. I, I use a lot of oyster shell th through the breeding months, but only through the breeding months. I don't use it any other time, but that, and I may use some, like Kenny said, with the hens, only the hens, not the cocks, but only the hens through the moat, a little bit yeah. of oyster shells, but that, that was it. I'm not saying that, um, you shouldn't give calcium. I'm just telling you, I, I don't always give them calcium all the time. I'm not, telling you which way is better i'm just that's how i do it okay so uh the next thing you would start you go from the egg and then you guys are looking at the baby chicks you know when they hatch are do they have you know deformities right off the bat how they look are they healthy are they active are they thrifty okay are they lethargic are they dragging do they have issues there you know are they um you know that's what i look for you know you go and a lot of people they won't cull the chick for various reasons, but you're going to be feeding that chick, you know? So what I do is when the hen hatches her bur uh, babies is um, I'll pull her out. I'll take the chicks, put them in a bucket. I look them over real good. And then I move her and her baby chicks into the broody houses. And so anytime I pick up a chicken, I'm looking it over. I don't care if it's a, you know, a baby chick. I don't care if it's a quail sized bird. I'm looking them over. And that's one of my opportunities. To look them over is when they're baby chicks and I'm moving to the broody house. Well, that's a good point too, Kenny, because a lot of times, okay. 
if you start with the egg, just say, for instance, you say, oh, this egg is really bad shape. This egg's bad shape. And you hatch six of those bad shaped eggs. If they do hatch and you get birds from those, just say, okay, well, I'm going to cull anyway, so what's the big deal? Well, you've got all the time, caregiving, money for feed, your time going out in the rain, bad weather, you know, taking time out of your day to go feed these birds. And I'd much rather, Kenny, go go feed and take care of birds that I know is going to make good quality birds than you are still got money in that bird from the day it hatches to the day that you cull it. And a lot of times, you know, just keeping those culls around, they can build up. And that's a lot of money that you're putting into birds that will never, you, you won't ever get anything out of them. Yeah. Start looking for, um, like everybody asked me, well, what are you looking for in baby chicks? Cause sometimes it's not as obvious. I mean, the obvious ones would be a twisted beak. Okay. A lot of times a twisted beak is, it comes with the deformity in the eye too. Have you ever seen that where the twi the beak is twisted and then they have a bad, mm -hmm. uh, uh, they're like missing an eye type of thing. Curl toes is a big one and poor eyes. So those would be the things you notice uh, right off the bat. Now, what you're going to notice is as they mature and they, you know, they grow and develop and they mature, uh, other things are going to be exposed because obviously you're not going to be able, you know, check them out for confirmation and type. A lot of times I don't even color when they're baby chicks. Okay. Now that is another thing too. Not that you have to kill them. You can get rid of them. But if you're trying to develop a certain color, you know, and I, let's say I want dark reds and they're producing maybe some chickmunk ch chicks, but they're also producing um, wheaten or buff colored chicks, then I obviously don't want to raise up those wheaten chicks because I'm, it's going to take me down the wrong road. So then I would get rid of those too. That's just another thing to consider. But then you have the stags and pullets. So after the, usually a lot of people have been asking me lately, um, when do I start um, culling the uh, stags and pullets? Oh, no, no. When I got sidetracked here, when do you start taking the, the babies away from their mother? And I usually tell them about six weeks old is when I, that's my mark. That's the day I usually plan on it. And uh, you want to come on, Nancy? You don't, she doesn't know how to do it. You want me to put her on? There we go. Can you hear us? Nope. Uh, nope. Let me is try. She, is she muted Unmute yourself? Look on the screen and click on, look on the screen on your picture on the screen and unmute you. Right at the very bottom, Nancy. Yeah, there you go. All right. Okay. Hey, so, hey everybody. I'm finally here. What I need you to do what, before you get going is start looking at the, uh, questions and comments, start flagging some that look like, cause I haven't been, had a chance to really look at them. See yep. if there's anything we need to discuss. We're going to be talking about deep Already on it. Okay, good. So anyways, so anyways, I plan on pulling the chicks out when they're six weeks old. Now, if the hen, there's certain signs I look for that I may want to pull the chicks out early. That means, you know, the hen's eating before the baby chicks, the hen starts laying, she starts picking on them, things like that. Then I'll do it a little bit earlier. But um, six weeks is usually the mark. So what I'm trying to say is, when I'm moving the chicks away from the mother to the grow-up pens, again, I'm looking them over again. I'm looking for obvious defects. Uh, again, we're not going to be looking at confirmation. We're gonna, not looking at the type. We're not looking for some of the you know color a lot of times at that age, but we are looking for the obvious defects. So anytime you pick them up, anytime you move them, that's when you look them over. And that's just, uh, that's just good management use that time to go over them because so many times, and I used to be terribly bad for this, Kenny, back years ago, I'd find something wrong with a bird and I'd have it in my hand at the time and I would see what was wrong with the bird. And I'd always put it off to the next day. Well, I won't call him today because, you know, I don't want to deal with it today. And I would put him back in the cage or the, the grow up pen or free range, whatever it was. And it will go on another, you know, three or four weeks and I'd have it back in my hand. And I was always making excuses. And I promise you, if you see the, if a bird has a obvious defect, call that bird right then and there. Don't, don't put it off. It will save you money. It will save you time. And it'll make you a much better breeder in the long run. And I get like that sometimes where I see a bird that kind of needs to be cold and I kind of hold off, but then I, 
I say, okay, that thing's costing me money. You know, I'm feeding this thing every day. I'm not going to let it sit there and starve to death or nothing. So I got to do something with this. So uh, the cost is the biggest criteria. Hey, Nancy, can you have Tawny bring me my water? I forgot to get my water. Well, what about this one, Kenny? What about <laughs> you've got these birds that they've got one little thing wrong with them. Let's say white, white in the wings and, and one of your black pearls, say it's got a white wing feather. But the bird is perfect in every way, except for one little minor detail. Those are the those are the hardest ones to do. But I think the breeders that's able to go on and do what they're supposed to do and cull end up making the better breeders because the ones that's not willing to do what it takes usually is not going to go to that higher level as a breeder. That that that's the way I had to look at it in order to start doing that. Now, some of them, some people would argue with you and say that uh, colors last and confirmations first, and I would agree with them for the most part. But like my black pearls, there are times when the color is a big deal because if you are not careful and you're not paying attention to color, you're going to lose it. You know, and if you're breeding a, uh, a type of variety that depends on the color um, and it, it can only go in one direction, then you need to pay attention to that kind of thing, definitely. So um yeah color color can be one of those things that they like one like you said and you've seen me do it frank i've even showed you pictures where i had a bird with one lousy white feather that was enough for me to get rid of her that type of thing you know but you know you and and, and you taught me this i had a bird and he when kenny was here and he was perfect all except Kenny said, oh, Frank, he's a real nice bird. Why, why aren't you going to breed that bird? I got him out of the cage. I pulled his wing out, and he had one dot on the tip of his feather. And uh, me and Kenny got talking, and Kenny said, well, you know, of course, it doesn't matter the size. It's there. It's evident. It could be his whole wing, and it'd be the same. That's right. So if I breed that bird, now, if I was just starting a strain with that bird, I wouldn't let that bother me. You know, if I was just starting using him for seed fowl or something, that wouldn't bother me. And of course, when I was talking about the white wing feather in there, uh, being the cull, uh, I was meaning, you know, somebody had had birds uh, already established strain. Now, if I was just starting out in it, I wouldn't let that worry me. Color would not worry me. But, you know, if you had birds 30 years, especially uh, black breasted uh, blacks, and you're getting white in them, you better take care of that fast because if not, just like Kenny said, it will, yeah. you know, it can just destroy your family. It's like my sangriel, you know, um, most of the blood in it comes from um, my Maximus line. I use the Maximus line to create it. But the initial seed fowl was a Maximus, Maximus cock with a Johnny Jumper hen. Now, I'm not going to say there's so much percentage Johnny Jumper and all like that. You know, you know me better than that. I'm not going to say that. But I did start it with a Johnny Jumper hen and a Maximus cock. And then every year I bred everything to the Maximus side. So what I did was I, in, I introduced white in the wings and white in the tail and all that kind of stuff because of that Johnny jumper hen. So I had to do a lot of culling in the beginning to get rid of that white. And if you look out there now, I have no white in my wings. I have no white in my tail, nothing showing up whatsoever. Uh, even splash was coming out of that you know so it took a lot now what i will so understand that most of your calling is going to be in the very beginning like if we look at members and they're using the founders program we talk about it all the time those first three, three stages are the cleanup you know it's the cleanup stages and part of that is not only calling for defects but it's calling for you know foreign color that's not right for the breed um, I will say this, though, so everybody listen up carefully, is that when, um, and I don't get to so much with my um, Maximus line, but I do get it with the Black Pearls, I do get it with the Sangreal, and that is the baby chicks will show white in the wings, you know, but when they molt out, that white goes away. So don't judge color all the time until you get to know the family real well on what the young you know, quail sized birds are actually producing because those, that color, that young chick color will go away or could go away and then bring in the full color that you want. Just so you know. And we see this a lot with American games. 
Yeah, I've even, and I'm sure you've seen this before, Kenny. I've seen them even be mature and mold out, you know, of their adult feathering in the first moat and come in totally different color. Yeah. So you've got to be real, and especially when starting a new strain, you've really got to let them mature, mature. And we preach this, okay? Mm-hmm. We preach this. That's the reason we want them to be mature before we ever make any decisions on breeding them. And that's the the section that you look for when they do mature in that, okay, you've gotten past the growth development part. You got them into maturity. You're breeding them and everything, but there's a, you know, you're still culling them at that point. You're still looking for things to cull, even though they're, they've passed the, you know, the questionable part. Uh, Even if you've been breeding for a few times, you're going to, you're going to cull them. You're going to be watching out for fertility a lack of fertility you're going to be watching out for hens that aren't really having the best um hatch hatchability rate okay like frank was saying there's genetic triggers that will come up that once you start seeing that you got to stop breeding them and you got to maybe reconsider their offspring at that point that's why it's it's a good idea not just to have one broodcock or whatever i don't want to go into some of the details and i think uh some of my members were going to see where i was about ready to go but there's some things about the founders program that there's an insurance policy you know, that protect against that. So that when you have something that shows a genetic trigger, you have, you've not, you're not completely locked in. You have a place to go. Okay. If there's anything that, what Nancy, go ahead. Okay. Well, before we get to Steve, how many molts should your brood, fa- uh, through, yeah, brood fowl go through before you decide to use them as your breeders? You know, I usually say that need to at least go through the first molt. Okay. But I'll even go more specific than that. I like to wait till they're at least 18 months old before I start breeding them. Preferably, I like to see them two years. So if you're hatching them in the spring and you breed in the spring, then they should be almost right around two years old when you're getting ready to breed them anyways. So I give them a little bit, a little bit of allowance, um, 18 months, you know, if they're mature, looking good, healthy and all that kind of stuff. But I always say two years, you know. Okay. Well, yeah. That sounds pretty good because you might not, you might not get the triggers or the different changes after one molt, the young molt. So it's better if you let them go through two molts, right? No, not necessarily. One, basically one one molt will get you into the breeding season after that. Okay. New uh, triggers are bastards because they come in when you don't expect them to. And they they can come in years later too. (laughs) You're right. And and here's the thing. Anybody that knows my birds know I love the white in the tail. White in the tail. Okay. But uh, Kenny can vouch for this for one. It is one of the trickiest things that you've ever dealt with. And it can, it can slip up on you and just mess your birds completely up. I've had this happen in the past and I've got one line that I've got that just completely black tails, uh, you know, no white in the wings that I use for show. And then I've got the other birds that's got the white in their tail just to, to just to breed to, a, as a hobby. But uh, when you allow the white, I, I can show you pictures of many different ones. I have one that uh, Amanda named Christmas. He went from two white streamers, and then when he was a beautiful bird, even Kenny liked it. But when he went to a cock, his tail was snow white, and his wing feathers were snow white, and he had white under the, the hackles just completely went all over the bird. And then I had people calling me, asking me if they could just make the bird's tail white or just make the hackles white, you know, certain areas of the bird. But it really don't work that way. It's it, it it's something that you can never purify. You can you cannot purify it, whatever you do. Uh, many people's tried it, but they've, they've yet to do it. I'm going to get to Steve's uh, question here, but, um, and that, you brought up a, a serious uh, topic here in that there's a lot of people, we call them off colors a lot of times, mm-hmm. but there's a lot of colors people are breeding that they can't reproduce. Yeah. Okay. And they don't know it, you know, and I don't care what hen you breed them to or what direction you try to go. They just won't get where you think they're going to go, you know, and uh, they either get muddier and they get worse. You get a lot of leakage. I mean, it's just better to breed towards, a standard okay there's a reason it's a standard um and white in the wings is a big deal because white in the wings white in the tail because people think it looks cool which i agree there's something about it that looks appealing 
but you can't repeat it. You can't perfect it. You can't control it. And a lot of times it gets so bad that it goes in areas you don't want it to go. So I always tell people, breed away from it. Now, if you want to have some on your farm so you can enjoy them and look at them, that's, that's fine, you know. But actually for your foundation line, never build a foundation line on birds with faults like that because you're, you're not going to get where you want to go. Steve's saying, I had a stag last year that had white streamers in the, um, this year after the molt, he saw it. I can't read it. He doesn't, it. He he doesn't it have any white. white at all. Yeah, molded by him, a black tail. That happens. Or, you, yeah, that you happens. know, it, it can happen either way, vice versa. It can happen either way. Yeah. So, um, but it, it does show you something that's in there. So be aware of it and mm -hmm. be careful. Of the hint. This is, this is the thing, Steve, be aware of the hen that you breed them to. Now, if you knowing that that's in him, okay. And you breed them to a hen that shows white in her feathering and her plumage and her wing, or whether, sensitive. or even shows a little bit showing through the tail, you're going to, that's when you're going to produce the white in the offspring. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you won't be able to control it. So the fact that he turned solid afterwards, is kind of a good sign, but it also shows you need to be very careful of the hen you're going to breed them to now. It's going to make a big difference. And the hen tends to show a lot of her plumage faults or a lot of the faults that are related to plumage more than the cock sometimes, you know. And, so and, sometimes, and sometimes, Kenny's right, and sometimes they, uh, uh, either parent, neither parent will even show signs of it, and all of a sudden it just pops up. Uh, Kenny, you remember I had to get rid of one of my, my pairs in my line, my rotational, because all of a sudden they was producing fowl that had white on their 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 breast, not only in their tail but their breasts all over them. So yeah. I had to get them out, and now it just muddied up everything. Neither neither parent was showing any signs of the white, but evidently it was in there, and all of a sudden just boom, it just showed up out of nowhere. No, he's now, saying um... now, Steve um, got me. He got that was the question I was going to ask you next. And Steve, well, I, you know, it's hard to answer because um, that can be tricky. Because here's what happens if someone tells me like this, will tell me something in a text, but without seeing the birds, I could totally be misunderstanding what he's saying. So, okay, so what no, 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 I think I'm not done. I'm not done. Oh, okay. So, there's some white in the feathers could represent all kinds of stuff. So I would need to see pictures of his birds to tell him exactly what I think could be re uh, reproduced or what, what, what could happen down the road. I need to see pictures of the birds. I need to see pictures of the father. I need to see pictures of the mother. And I can tell you what's going to probably what's going to happen and what you need to do. But I would be only speculating at this point with that question. Well, because you had said a few minutes ago that there are some colors that you just can't get reproduced. Off color. And, and if it doesn't matter, blue. yeah. Well, blues, um, yeah, that's true. But blue is an incomplete dominant trait. It's yeah. Tony called it a haywire gene. I think it's funny how he says that. <laughs> but uh, that's actually different. Um, blue is blue. Blue, you know, um, that's just a different story because blue bred to do, like if how do I say this? If you breed blue to splash, it produces a certain percentage of blue and splash. Ble breed blue to uh, or splash to black, you get all blue, that kind of thing. So there's a certain combination that you can use to get a certain percentage of blue. Uh, splash being the only homozygous gene in the blue where it would only produce, reproduce itself. Blackwood, too, if there's no contaminants. Okay. So blue is a different. I don't usually breed or... Well, I was going on pure, make them pure, uh, pure, purifying. Well, she's asking about yeah. uh, off colors. So I don't look at off color. I don't look at blue as an off color because it has its own, it's kind of its own thing. Okay. Uh, off colors could be mixing, you know, gingers with white. Um, uh, what's another good one? Golden duck wing. Golden duck, du golden duck wing would be to me an off color. Well, it depends. I mean, it is a variety. It's in the standard. I don't know why it's in the standard. You can't reproduce it. You know, it's it's uh, strange how they do that. Piles is another one that's in the standard. That I don't think should be in the standard. It's a production of a dominant white with a red, like a light. I didn't red. understand that. I, I never did understood a pile being in the standard. No, never. you can't reproduce it. You have yeah. to do double mating, and you have to uh, breed. Yeah, you just can't keep it going. And if you just spread pile to pile, it either starts to 
you know, loses in, uh, color, it uses it, loses its intensity, or it completely goes the other way and just like, but it will never keep that pile color for long by breeding themselves. You'll see the the robin disappear from the hens, and once you start seeing that, you know, the ch the cocks are going to change color. Um, but you just see, if you look on Facebook and things like that, you see most of the birds out there are what I would call off color. Most of them can't be reproduced um, and really hard to fix. And if you're going to have an off-colored cock, you really need to make sure the hen is proper color and then go from go in that direction, you know, type of thing. So let me see if I'm getting this straight. So when what you mean by off-color is it doesn't represent a black-breasted red. It doesn't represent a silver duckwing, things like that. Pumpkin with white is a good one for off color. That that would be a good example of off color. I know there are others, but that's the one that comes to mind the biggest. Is you see more off colored birds with those two colors. Okay, um, yeah. Okay, now Rob says something pretty interesting here. Okay, you, you want me to read it? Yeah, oh read it. goodness! See, that's, the, that thing so far away, I can barely see it. Okay, let's see if I can pronounce these these words. The only thing you can breed for and homozygous home see I always get those homozygous homozygous trait. You can lock in homozygous traits, recessive or dominant, but traits that are heterozygous can never be locked in. Right. Right. It just it's showing yeah. you that yeah, they're expressing the dominant trait, but they're not pure for it. Okay. So once that's the problem, you know, we talk about like um, golden duck wings. They have a silver duck wing. They think, and we, hear, Frank and I hear this all the time, is, uh, oh, how do I improve my silver duck wing? Oh, breed red in it. That proves every, improves everything. Well, they just introduced, if it wasn't already in there, but they introduced the recessives into a dominant. Now it never goes away. It's a, it, Rob is exactly right. Once you introduce a recessive, you know, it's always there. Will it always be expressed? You can breed it to a point where it's not expressed. You know, dominant will, uh, um, after a time, will hide the recessive if you're careful. But it's always there to be expressed by bringing it to the wrong bird. So if you have two birds carrying the recessive trait, it's going to be expressed one way or another. Well, okay. Nancy was talking about the golden uh, of the uh, the silver duck wings. Okay, that's a prime example right there they put the red in it's in there forever you're never yep. going to get yeah. that silver back that's you right. muddied up the the whole thing you know yeah so, so that's what you're saying is off color well what rob is saying and i think it's right on the money basically inadvertently is that if you have a bird expressing a dominant trait it's pure for that trait do not you know not do not add recessives to it okay making here here's the problem too because everybody they and i see this all the time where they have these beautiful birds they think they're getting inbred. There's no sign of it. They're just worried about it. So they think they need to improve it by refreshing it. So they bring in outside blood, having no idea what's in that bloodline. Nothing. They have no idea exactly. They're, they don't even take the time to test it to see what's in it. So then they breed it into their family. And all of a sudden, they've got offspring that are all over across the board. They've got every color under the sun. They've, they're showing traits that they weren't shown before. And they basically ruin them. And then they panic and they add more blood and things like that. So you, when you, like I, I tell people, if you have a silver duckwing family and you've never seen leakage, you've never seen any red shown through, for God's sakes, don't add any blood to it. Okay. I'm not just saying don't add any red to it. I'm saying don't add anything to anything. it because you don't know what's in that. Okay. And sometimes it won't express itself until it, you breed to it. So the sad part is Kenny, Nancy, a lot of the the really good silver duck wings are gone. Yeah, oh, that, they've been destroyed over time. It's been a very long time since I have seen or come across a really good looking silver duck wing. You know that I could say, you know that looks the way it should look. You you don't see them anymore. That that's now, a shame. The now this is a tricky thing. Here is he, he's right as far as a pure silver duck wing they're really hard to find if they're out there at all um the closest i've seen people come is and i'm going to be careful how i say this because it happens to be every time i see it that's what they say it is okay so i'm just going to say how it is <laughs> i know what he's going to say law grays yeah okay 
Now, the cocks are beautiful. The hens are a buff color, which is not typical of a silver duck wing. But everything I've seen, everybody I've talked to, the genetics and everything, said that you can get away with it as long as you understand the double mating system and you breed them that way. Then you can maintain by breeding properly. You have a hens line and a cocks line. You have a stag line and a pullet line, all that kind of stuff. If you understand how that works, you understand your family real well, you can you can do it in a way that it produces those silver duck wing roosters every time. And they're beautiful. They are. Okay. That, but you that's have what to I'm use doing with a double mating system. And it's that's, it, that, <laughs> that's exactly what I'm doing with mine right now, though, Kenny. That's yeah. exactly uh, I was talking to Chino, one of the members, and uh he has some of them. And I said, You've got to try this. We've got to get you set up with it because it will improve the color on them. I, I promise you. So we're going to set up a coaching call and go over it with him and see if we can get into that. Now, my, mine started out. Mine was you see mine, Kenny. My, mine was had, but it originally didn't have red. It had black added to it way back years ago. Uh, will they ever be pure for silver? No. Will I ever get them there? Hopefully. But it, it's been a lot, a lot of work. I tell you, a lot of work. I'm a firm believer that double mating only works if you understand the program and you understand mm -hmm. your birds. If you just get two birds and think you're going to do a double mating system, I don't think so. I don't know too many people can do it like that. Um, it takes it takes a family that you've you really understand, you know, that you've seen what they produce and everything, and th they don't have a lot of contaminants or other bloodline in them, you know. So, but. Um, we were talking about like the culling all goes from the egg all the way to the mature birds. And part of that is, is a, as the bird gets older, they're more susceptible to healthcare problems, diseases. They, they tend to lose their, um, the resistance to z disease as they get older. So you, you got to watch for that. So whenever you got, just because you got older birds and they've passed all the criteria, they're not showing defects. You're still, there's a time when you're going to still cull that bird and you've, got to cull him before he gets to that point where he's going to start producing or she producing offspring that are not going to be up to par so knowing when to cull them when to stop breeding them is important now you know they're okay to keep for for an extra anything you know you don't want to keep all your eggs in one basket but mm -hmm. like kenny said once they they reach an age, uh, age to where they're not going to produce for you uh why keep them why feed them why you know why have that expense just We'll go back the same way it was with chicks that we end up culling. That's you know I hate to do that. You've got a good good uh, bird that's produced all of his life, whatnot. But once they get over the hill, you're either feeding them because you like them, and you don't want to cull them, and you're putting all that money into them. And next thing you know, it's not just one; you've got several, or you know, a dozen that you're doing that with. And uh, this day and time, that's a lot of feed money, Kenny. Yeah. Yeah, feed's expensive now. I yes, do everything you can to keep that feed bill down. And and I would look for any chance I can. Like when I'm feeding my birds every day and I'm walking through there, I I don't just throw feed and walk around. I don't just throw feed, go to the next one and throw feed. I don't try to rush through it. If you see me out there, and Nancy's seen it, I'll feed a bird yeah. and I'll sit there and stare at it for a while. I'll look it over. I'll look over its feed. I'll look over its legs. I'm looking over everything. And then I always pick up a bird or two every day, check them over move them to a different pen, that kind of thing. And uh, so I'm always looking for a reason to call because I do not want to raise a bird that has no future on my farm, you know, or just going to eat up feed and cost me money down the road. And I definitely, I don't sell birds, but I give birds away from time to time. And I definitely don't want to give someone a bird that has a problem. Okay. Nothing uh, makes me more mad than pick up a bird I've had for a year and a half and <laughs> realize it has a trait or it has a defect that I should have called months ago. You know what I mean? Nothing makes me more mad when I see that. And, and then you're thinking, well, if I miss this, what else have I missed? Yeah. So you start checking every pin, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, then still, uh, and then he still misses stuff because, you know, a yard blind yeah. takes it, takes it still. Well, like in there. Like out there, everything's kind of muddy. So if tomorrow, I'm going to spend a good portion of the day cleaning up pens and moving birds around. And I can guarantee you, like I've got quite a few pens out there with, you know, six to 10 hens. And I think some have 12 hens in them. And I'll guarantee you that I'll move that pen of birds into another pen. I'll probably call easily one or two of those birds every time. That's either they have something that's I don't like or I'm that picky, you know. My He's wife, Amanda. Picky. 
I'm that my big. wife, my <laughs> wife Amanda doesn't understand that with what Kenny was talking about taking a bird from one cage and putting him in another, moving them around. Oh, but important. you know, yeah, it, it's like I told her, I said, how would you like it to spend every day of your being in one room of the house yeah. and not be able to go out? So, you know, you, you, you take a bird and especially a cock, you put him in a pen, you leave him there for three or four months. He'll get inactive. You know, he'll get just like in a slumber, but you take that bird and you keep him moved like every other week or every couple of weeks, they stay active. They stay busy. It gives them, it gives them, you know, it's different to them. They like, like something different. You know, they're seeing different birds on the farm. Uh, I think it's a uh, much, uh, much healthier for them to keep them in movement that way. And they stay in better shape too, I think. Yeah. But I don't know about a hen. I think are different though. Right. What? You don't want to um, move a hen around well, too many well, times because they get stressed. Yeah, okay. I wouldn't move a brood hen around exactly, but pullets, I'd move them. Okay. Move them. Yeah, yeah. Easily. Yeah. Um, yeah. They tend to like, they get, uh, once they're familiar with their surroundings, they don't like to be moved all the time. Uh, roosters love to be moved. So, yeah. Yeah. They, they, they say, like, well, now I'll tell you what, I've had hens before, uh, older hens that you could switch them from a different brood pen and it would stress them out so much that'd be, you know, it'd stop them from laying three or four days. Yeah. Oh yeah. And yeah. then they start back laying, you move them three or four more days, you know, it, yeah. it does. Nancy's right. It does stress a hen out, but now, uh, the Cox, regardless if it's commercial bird, whatever it is, if it's a rooster, he just eats it up. He loves it. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Love your surroundings. Yeah. You guys, we're missing favorite. some really good questions on the topics that you've been on going back to color. Um, Steve was asking, so pumpkin can't be bred pure. He's saying, can it be bred pure? Oh, can yeah. It be, yeah, can well, it be? And he said with pure. white in it. Yeah, with a lot of white. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I mean, if you're seeing foreign color or some contaminants, you're gonna have a problem fixing that. Okay. Uh, pure pumpkin, like a uh, the ones that are related to gingers. Um, now, ginger is a really cool breed in that they've got that buff color they've got the greenish blue leg they got the dark eyes uh very beautiful birds i used to think all the time they were crowing but they're actually in the duckwing family but um you know it what people have done is they've bred like um other birds into them like white into them they've bred you know black breasted reds they've tried to breed black bre black black breasted black reds into them and just messed them up and now they're coming all different colors so can they breed pure um, it really depends on the ones he has, how much contamination's in them right now, what the hens look like. Can we, so I cut, I'm, what I'm trying to say is I need to see his birds. I need to see his cocks and his hens, see what we're dealing with and, um, what the color of the legs are, uh, talk to him about what he's seen when he breeds them, what kind of feather color are we getting? What kind of leg colors? What's the variations that are popping up from that? And that'll determine that will help me determine how to breed them, how to create a strain from that. So I actually have to do a coaching call with him. Steve's a member, so he can always do that with me, you know, um, just to give him a blanket statement I, without seeing his birds. I don't know. I can't do that. So. So. Um, what's that, Nancy? OK, BB Red from a Wheaton bred family. One, how long should stacks stay black? Um, number two, will breeding to partridge over time reduce the effect of them coming black at okay. first? If he's talking about the, the kind of BB red we have American games that kind of throw the wheat in hens, then he's not going to see the partridge. It's it's different. And um, I've seen people breed those into a partridge family and then ruin ruin the color really fast. So... Um, I actually don't like those myself. I like the partridge type bird. The That's partridge bad. bred BB reds, black breasted reds. The black breasted reds, they are different. You, have you seen them, Frank? I, I used mm -hmm. to get them from my Colonel Givens a long time ago where I'd get the partridge and then I'd get those other type. And that's how I ruined the Sangreal, um, the Tecumseh line that were light reds because I had them coming really good. But the Wheaton hens I ended up using, was I wasn't paying attention. I just figured Wheaton was Wheaton. Uh, they were actually from the BB red side, not the Wheaton side, and they ruined the color of my my uh, Wheatons. So, uh, yeah, they're completely different. He's they're not the same breeding. Um, yeah, that's, that's easily done though. 
that's and, very easily done. Yeah, and the fact he's saying how long should they say black just shows me everything I need to know. Uh, it's exactly what they are. They're not the partridge mm -hmm. type. Right. Yep. And they, they'll they'll start showing that BB red color, which is very dark, um, but it's, it's different. It's different than the partridge type black breasted reds. So I got actually got rid of those. I I didn't like them, and um, went with the partridge all the way. Well, okay, so Tyler's asking, what do you all think best represents a, a red-breasted red fowl for standard purposes? And would rel, ah, would red or black face be more correct? Shouldn't they always be crowing? Uh, so he's talking about a black-breasted black red, I take it. Um, now, some do come red-faced. Some come gypsy-faced. And they should face be meaning black, right? Black. Purple, like a purplish yeah, purple. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, and they should be crowing. Yeah. Yep. So um back to coaling. Um <laughs> back to coaling. Yeah. Wait, I gotta say something real quick. Frank, you clean up very nicely. You look like great. <laughs> uh, I know. I'm sure you did because I was like, and uh, George has a little something here to say. The distractor is here. <laughs> so <laughs> my troublemaker is uh, in the house. <laughs> just okay. wanted to let you all know. Hey, he, he, he's been good so far. Okay. <laughs> he, he, well, so far, he just, he's been good. He just got here. He was a little Oh, okay. Late. Okay. So, that might be the reason. Now that. in the house. So here so we go. When we look at, the difference between what I would call a good breeder and a bad breeder or a poor breeder. And there's a difference. One never accepts flaws. Okay. And he always calls for defects and poor health. And it's funny because if you look at peddlers, they never call hard enough. And to them, every bird has a monetary value. And if they have a defect, it's something that it's more the buyer's well, a problem, not theirs. If it has a sickness, they just pump enough into it just to get the symptoms down, and then they pass it along. But a good breeder sees those kind of faults, and he calls them right away, calls ruthlessly. You know, I could not understand for the life of me why anybody would want to do that. But I'll say this. Going back to where I used to run a hospital till now, there's no way in the world I would put that kind of money back into birds and go through that aggravation again. I, I would literally, and I'm being honest, I would get rid of them before I would go through that again, ever. I really would. I just, people don't understand as long as you're doctoring them and giving them a crutch, you'll never get better. They'll never get better. As soon as they come out of the egg, people's giving them uh, LS 50 antibiotics yeah. because they've been taught that uh, they worm them every two weeks because they was taught that. In the real world, it doesn't have to work that way. But that's expensive by itself. Could you imagine going back through that now, Kenny, just the the, the money that you'd put into medicine alone? I, I think of the money, but I mostly think about all those chemicals and antibiotics and all the other stuff I'm pumping into those birds, which I don't think they really need. And there's other ways to take care of that. And they could, if they just cold, um, just took some time to cull those sick ones and just raise the healthy ones. They wouldn't have to deal with that anymore. I saw a video the other day where someone filled up this five gallon bucket, put a whole bunch of antibiotics in it, filled it up and then took that and filled up all the waters throughout their whole, all their teepees were filled up with water from this bucket. Coast spell coming through. What's that? Coast yeah. spell was coming oh, through. Yeah. yeah. So if yeah. they're anticipating a sickness, then that tells me they always have sick birds that those birds are susceptible to the sickness that, and they're always going to be pumping medications into them. I mean, I'm more worried about the people buying those birds than I am them, you know, but there's, that tells me everything I want to know. If I'm out there looking for birds to buy and I see that kind of practice, I would run the other way. I'd run as far away from that as possible. And I think part of the problem is too, is, and I was there, I was there a long time ago where I thought that was normal. I thought giving the birds medications all the time was what you needed to do to run a farm, that it was standard practice. Yeah. Okay. Until, and again, I probably told the story a million times, but Tony came over and started throwing them all into the trash can said, you can't create a strain. You can't run a farm this way. 
you cannot, you're not going to, um, you're not going to be able to move forward when you're always medicating, running a hospital. I remember him saying that. And he started t- throwing those bottles in the trash can and him looking at me and I says, your uncle Tony just did you a favor. He did. Cull, cull the sick ones, raise yeah. the healthy ones. And eventually you're not going to have any sick ones anymore. And it was tough because it took a few years <laughs> to where yeah. I didn't see any more sick birds. I felt like I was calling most of them. Now to this day, I rarely ever have a sick bird. I can't remember the last time I have a, I've had a sick bird, except for pox once in a while. I, I don't I don't see anything anymore. This and is that's what worries mostly, me. Okay. Go on, Nancy. Go on. And that's mostly environmental, isn't it? The pox that we get going through the yard from now and now and again. Yeah, f- for the most part. I mean, it's um a bit uh, ubiquitous. You know, everybody uh, has a chance to get in pox, but they do build an immunity once they've been exposed to it. Um, but you can practice good biosecurity by walking around the farm and getting rid of any stagnant water, things like that, and water that you can't get rid of, put a little bleach in or whatever. So change the, the bird's uh, drinking water often, that kind of thing. So there's things you can do to minimize your risk of pox, but completely being... Um, totally avoiding it. I don't think that's going to happen, but some families are more susceptible than others too. You know, Yeah, I used to have it bad and I'm not, uh, it's so bad. I had to vaccinate for it, but since I started good husbandry and biosecurity, dealing away with the water, uh, taking certain measures to protect my birds. Cause I had them in the, the top of my, my dome pens through the day, you could walk up and slap that dome pen and just thousands of mosquitoes would come out of those, Yeah, wow. you know, all over the place. So what I was doing, <laughs> spraying up underneath those pins, and I noticed my pox just gradually went away. But going back to the eggs, guys, the only thing I hope, me and Amanda eat our eggs, uh, you know, what we're not hatching, because we'll get three or four dozen eggs a day. And we've got, you know, uh, laying hens plus our game eggs. And we keep a lot of the family supplied in eggs. But one thing I hope they're not doing, these guys is giving all this medicine. I hope to God they're not eating these eggs. Yeah. Because if they're eating these eggs, they're putting that medication right back into their family, their mm-hmm. self's bodies. Because everything that goes in that chicken's egg, you know, through that chicken is coming right back through that egg. So, uh, you know, they're they're taking all those antibiotics and, and those bad chemicals right in their bodies as well. Yeah. Drug residue. Big time. Yeah. You know. In the and soul, some are worse than others. Yeah, it's in their soul, and some of those some of those medications will stay in it, just like uh, uh, ivermectin. It'll mm-hmm. stay in the soul up to a decade. So it's killing all the insect, all the worms, you know, the night crawlers, everything in, in that area. When those chickens uh, uh, use the bathroom, it's going right into back into the soul. So then you've got another problem. Yeah. So what's George saying? Anthony? George is saying, is it? If he had the Breeders' Academy back then, 20 years ago, I think I would have a whole lot more money in my savings account. <laughs> Thanks, George. That's yeah. true. I hear that a lot. Yeah. This saves them a lot of money. Um, and that's another thing I tell people is I've had a few people tell me recently that um, they can't afford to join because, well, they just can't afford it. And I says, do you have chickens? Yeah. How many chickens do you have? Oh, about 100. Then you can afford it. Don't ever tell me when the, when the price of uh, membership is the price of maybe a bag or two of feed. Don't tell me you can't afford the membership if you can afford your chickens. And I guarantee you, I'm going to save you more money. Uh, if you join the membership, I'll save you more money uh, than, than if you didn't join because of the showing you how to breed them properly, which one should be cold. Uh, there's probably a lot of birds. Oh, Tony and I used to joke with each other all the time, and I and I still believe it today, that if we walked on someone's farm, even some of these guys that are known as the best breeders around, that we could probably easily cull more than half their birds. Easily. Maybe more. Yeah. You know, and show them why. And then, you know, I, I don't think they would even be able to argue with, with us. And I I think they maybe hold on to some because maybe there's a monetary value there, or sometimes they don't even know that they're defects, you know, but we could probably cull quite a bit. Oh yeah. So if if we call like Mother Nature, we'd be a lot better breeders. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Well, back to uh, a black-breasted red family. Mm-hmm. 
would which would be correct for a black breasted red family um a wheaton or partridge okay well he's got me confused because well, he's just red breasted red yeah so i'm not sure what he means by that. Is he talking about a brown red family okay that's different you know that's that's a whole different story altogether Are i they, think that's what he's talking about maybe talking about a brown breasted red family but um brown breasted brown red family yeah am i saying that right um which is rare. I don't know too too many people have it. I know Frank has it, you know, but it's a very rare mm -hmm. thing. So if he's talking about that, that's a crow wing fam. Nancy, put that back up. I need to look at it. One oh, time. okay. Oh, always just leave it up there until we're done talking about it. Because I got to. Okay. Okay. It helps me remember what he's saying because I go off in tangents if not. <laughs> so if he's talking about a brown breasted red family, then we're talking about a crow wing family. He's not going to see. Uh, what do you get, Frank, and as far as the hand color? I'm trying to remember. You'll get, uh, sometimes you'll get almost all black. Yeah. And then you'll get uh, the the wheat and type, but it'll be the red on the, the neck, black with red on the neck. No, the black ones, do they have they, like, uh, they have any anything in the breast? So, some of the hens will have the, the brown, you know, yeah. the brown on their chest. Okay. So, some do, some don't, but they'll still produce, you know, the, the, the brown do breast show, that you needed for it. Partridge, do they show any stippling in the in the body in the uh, plumage? Now, uh, the, when I first got them, they did, but uh, I bred them all to the 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 one color, you know. So now I don't I don't get many of those yeah. at all. Um, I'm trying to remember what the hens do look like. Um, but you just have uh, just like a wheat and hen, but they'd be all black with just the red on the neck, you know, the wheat and the type yeah, red on the right, neck. right, right, kind of like. Yeah. The, Kind of like this. I don't know if you guys can see this. Can, can you see that? Kind of like that. That's maybe? it. That's okay. it. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly. Okay. So, yeah, they're a little different than a typical black breasted black red, but they're in the mm -hmm. same family. They're in the crow wing family, you know, um, harder to keep going. Hopefully you don't have a lot of contaminants, whole, a lot of other stuff. But um, if it, I were you, if you have a, and I hope we're talking about the right thing because he's the way he's describing it. If you do have a brown, red family a real brown red family um maybe do some test matings with the different hens you have because obviously it sounds like you have different color hens see which ones are producing the right color and go with them and get rid of the rest that's what i would do yeah he's not saying anything else down here at the comments of okay. of correcting of what he's saying so you we'll know go kenny go, going back on that i've had those uh steven give me some of those back uh I think it was 2015, 2016. I'm not sure. It was way, way, way back. And even today, well, that, you know, that's a short period of time within having a family, really. But uh, you look at mine and you look at his now, and they look like two different type families. They don't even look closely remote together. You yeah. Know? See, that's what I mean. If he's not careful, he can go in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. so, well, he, he he's done a great job with them because you remember the, the one bird that uh, you saw, Stevens, uh, uh, I think it was last year. Yeah. It's just amazing look. look no, I agree. It, I'm talking about the guy good. we're talking to right now. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he yeah. needs to be careful what direction he goes. So doing some test matings and see which which hand will take you in the right direction would probably be a really good idea. Um, that makes a huge do, difference. Yeah. And I wish I could tell him how to do it in the Founders Program because I already have some ideas that I would do if I were him. But Okay. Uh, um, he said... The red oh. breast came from light red, black breasted reds. What is it? What kind of bird is he raising? Because um, I'm, I need. To well, now, that. Kenny, uh, what I think I know what he's talking about because some of these, these guys took what originally they called the brown and red, and they infused uh, green legged black breasted reds into them mm -hmm. over a period of time. They still come. They still come uh, a light red, but they've got dark breasts. They don't have the brown breasts. So I think uh, pretty much not pretty close to your black pearls is what he's talking about, I think. Okay. Wade, contact me inside the Brewers Academy. Let's set up a coaching call, get some pictures together. Let me see what you got, and then we can talk. Because I'm a little <laughs> not sure what we're talking about. Here. He's saying, do you want the name game? <laughs> no. <laughs> you know what? Yeah, that does help. Tell me what he. Yeah, tell me what he thinks. Okay, of. that's yeah, what right. I was getting ready to say. That'd give us an right. ideal. Yeah. All yeah. right, let's see what Tyler I says here. Move anything in the overall scheme of things, but it might tell me where we we're at. Right. 
So let me let me know. Sometimes it can be helpful with the the language. I know we're trying to change the language, but it can be he helpful sometimes. So. Yeah, I just it, once you start bringing them yourself. Are we talking about the same guy? The, they are. Yeah, yeah. Oh, they get peak. Right, right. Yeah, it doesn't mean. Well, see, I still now I'm real confused. Yeah, I am too. Oh, okay, oh, here we go. Yeah, here we that, go. Diesel Davis kills those. Oh, okay. okay. So they're just black breasted reds. Yeah, they're not. I don't know why you call them red breasted. Okay. Yeah. So they're just black breasted reds. Could have been a typo. Yeah. Could have been you a know, typo. Uh, who was it saying that they had uh dark, really dark black breasted reds? They were wondering if they were going to come Wheaton and Partridge, and how long would they be dark? That's what he has. Yeah. He has one. He has some of those. So they're not a partridge color. He okay. He's gonna get. He's gonna get really dark cocks with wheat and hens if they're the what I think they are. That should be. That yeah. Should be what he has. Yeah. So he's gonna get dark cocks with wheat and hens. And uh, I hope that answers this question. Okay. That I should ask that first. Sometimes that helps. You know, it kind of gives an idea where they're going. You know. It does. But um, I just don't want you thinking that you create a family and in 10 years from now, you're still calling them Cecil Davis Kelsos because yeah. that's not how it works. Um, I guarantee you that a lot of that bloodline is um, diminished or been contaminated and there's all kinds of things in there. But the Cecil Davis, I remember when I was a kid, we just lost Nancy. You okay? Yeah. Okay. The, was that the, I'm going to go help her in a second. The Cecil Davis Kelsos, I knew when I was a kid, were very dark roosters. They were black breasted reds and they had they were wheaten hens. And they were oh there she is. There she is. Um they were God, what were they? Frank, were they white or green? Uh white or yellow legged? I thought uh, they were yellow white. Legged. Well they had a they had a white and a yellow. They had both. He and had both were, and there. they were straight comb too. Yeah that's uh what they were the original then. ones were yeah yeah so that's what they were then but if you're gonna create a family from that you're going to have to move away from that name because that name is going to hold you back. That name's going to, you know, it's, it's not going to allow you to move forward because you're going to create them what you want. You're, you know, like I said, we could do a coaching call. We can talk about the founders program. We can talk about what it takes to create the family, but those offspring are going to show you what direction you need to go. And I can guarantee you in 10 years, they're going to look completely different than they are today. Okay. And that's without adding any outside blood. What happened, Nancy? I don't know. I just got popped out, so huh. I popped back in. <laughs> okay, good. So you know how to do that. I thought I was going to have to rescue you. I figured it out. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, the one of the differences between a good breeder and a, a good breeder and a poor breeder is the fact that good breeders really, how do I say this? They're willing to make the tough decision. We were talking about this one time. I don't know if Frank was talking about it to me. We talk about so many things all the time, whether we're on the show or not. I never know which is which sometimes. But I remember talking to him about that a lot of people just don't make the tough decision to do the culling. Because um, culling is hard for some people. But good breeders, they'll make that hard decision. They'll do the culling when it needs to be done. And they'll be glad they did it once it's over. Okay. Uh, I used to. This is what, what I used to do, though, Kenny. You know. Used to my heart wasn't as soft as it was, and then it got up to a certain age, and then I'll just be honest with it. I didn't like doing it. it; made me feel bad when I done it. So what I do, I'd give them to the next victim. Somebody'd <laughs> come to to the yard and say, "Hey, can I have some of your birds?" And I'd be like, "Well, I've got this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one that you can have." They're like, "Oh, I'll take all of them," you know. And then I got to thinking about that. You know, I wasn't doing anybody any favors by giving them those birds. You know, I was, if there wasn't good enough for me to have on my yard, I shouldn't been giving them to other people. So I, I had to sit down one day and I'd say, you know, either you're going to do this and do it right or don't do it at all. So I, I had to force it by myself. But once you get used to doing it, it's just like breathing or, you know, uh, anything else, like riding a bicycle. You, you, you have to, you have to get yourself used to doing it. And it, it's hard to do. I'm not going to lie. It's hard to do, but you, you, ha once you start doing it, you get, get the hang of it, I guess. In the early days, um, I didn't sell a lot of fowl, not because I didn't want to sell them. I didn't have the connections. I didn't even have the Gamecock magazine back then, okay? So it wasn't like I had the connections to even sell birds in the first place. So it wasn't even something that I thought about doing. Um, and then early on, when I met um, Tony Seville, he's the one actually introduced me to the Gamecock magazine. I didn't even know it existed until then. 
okay, I was in this for a long time. I had friends that were doing this for a long time. We never talked about the magazines whatsoever. But Tony's the one that introduced me to the Gamecock magazine. And then once I started learning from him and I started teaching what he was teaching me, I started writing for the magazine pretty early on. So when you put yourself out there, I don't know how other people feel, but this is how I feel. And there's some people actually having YouTube channels like that, and you think they'd feel like I do, that if my name's out there and I'm putting myself out there and I'm acting like the authority, selling a, a defect would be a bad thing because your reputation is going to fall yeah. you pretty quickly. Yeah. And so if I learned very quickly, if I was going to do this, then I had to be a harder caller than anybody else. That every any bird that showed even the signs of a defect, that that thing had to be cold because it ever made its way off my farm, I was going to look bad. You know, oh, he's supposed to be this great selector, this great breeder. He's supposed to know everything about breeding. He writes these articles, but look what he sent me. That was not going to happen. And so you would think some of these people that have shows of their own or putting themselves out there as um, authorities would have stricter, a stricter criteria, you know, have a higher standard, you know, but all I've heard from people that bought birds from them is that they're kind of junk. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so um, that, that put me on notice, not on notice, but it made me uh, rise to a higher standard right off the bat, just because of what I did automatically. Even though I had the connections, I wasn't big into selling, but if I was going to sell birds or give birds away, I was going to make damn sure they got a good one. Because, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, the thing about it is you're not going to see a NASCAR team that's not even qualifying for a race keep sponsors very long, you know, in the yeah. same way with us. How, how long are you going to last, Kenny, if we're putting birds – just hideous type birds on there, post them saying, Oh, look at what I've got. It's a beautiful bird, you know, and he's mm -hmm. squirrel tailed. His bill's about, <laughs> you know, four inches long and his legs is about that long. His confirmations out. We're not going to last too long at all. Can I tell him about the picture you showed me the other day? Yeah. It was yesterday. Okay. So Frank sends me a picture of this cock and hen, and the cock had serious squirrel tail and rye tail at the same time and he had all these people pushing like and saying how much they liked it and stuff like that and i'm like what well, are they really missing that that bird had that bad of a defect or the yard blind or what are they looking at i didn't i don't really understand how they could miss something like that but they thought that was a good bird so not only the breeder put it on there because obviously he thought it was a good bird he would never would have put it on there and then you got people pushing like and telling much they like it because they liked it so we've got a really a huge disconnect between what the birds should look like and what they look like today i think we got you're right them. you're right kenny but here, here, here's the main thing uh, i read through the comments and what was being said this guy had bought broodfowl off a well-known breeder that's really popular right now and that's what all the hubbub was. It wasn't that they was not one time did anybody mention, hey, that, that bird squirrel tailed and he's right tailed. I mean, and we're not talking about a little bit. No, we're talking about the tail laying over and in the back of his head. Yeah. Type. It was it like was cocked over like that, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just because of the name that it come from the breeder, you know, everybody loved it. They they loved the name. They didn't love the bird. They loved the name. Pretty so much. That's what I mean. I mean, so did that breeder not know that that's a defect okay or did he not care about his reputation or did he think the buyers were that dumb not to notice yeah there's some serious things going on there you know and it was in both sides of the family when the breeder sold him the fowl that he's got oh shoot really yeah because he showed some of the others that he had that was brothers to, and every one of them was the same way oh, they was no. they was completely 100 percent all the same way so was he complaining or did he thought it was okay the he, buyer uh, he he was bragging on them oh shoot yeah you know i didn't show you the other comments but in other comments he was showing brothers to that bird mm -hmm. and they was all consistent oh. and, and they they produced herself well but <laughs> in the worst kind of way you know they was re reproducing themselves but in the worst kind of way i was sitting in uh jury duty waiting to be interviewed or whatever which i never was i got out got out of there but i was wasting time and i was looking on my phone and someone put some pictures on there and wanted to know what everybody thought of these birds uh -oh. <laughs> and i usually don't do this you know i usually stay out of it you know i usually don't say nothing 
I say I remember all this. my shows, or I'll say if someone asks me directly, I'll answer them. But I usually don't go on there and you know give them my opinion about anything. Okay. Um, and so this guy asked, I go, well, he asked. Okay. So I go on there, I go, well, still, I, I would call all of them. They have serious <laughs> squirrel tail. They've got the wind was blowing, Kenny. Yeah. The wind no, was the blowing. we were blowing. Trust me. Okay. And, um, <clears throat> yeah. And every I picture I had was one. like that. And I said, well, he asked. So I got attacked pretty good. And I was like, you know, okay. I tried to help him. He didn't want the help. All his friends backed him up. They don't know better. Whatever. I tried to help and out I go. So I'll just stick with my members of the Breers Academy. They want my help. I enjoy helping them. We're improving the, the breed. Those guys can be left behind as far as I'm concerned. If they want my help, they know how to get a hold of me. I was like, wow. But they were severe. Uh, I the rat tail oh, yeah. and the squirrel tail. But what got me? Oh, it did have squirrel tail and right tail. I yeah. That. yeah. And what got me? He said, no, no, that's not. You know, every picture that was taken, there was several. And every one of them, you could tell it was severely squirrel and rat tail. But what got me was he told Kenny, said, no, 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 no. He's not squirrel tail. The wind was just blowing real hard. Yeah. And I lost it. I, I, <laughs> that's, that's what got me right there was the wind. Derek blowing. says it just right here. He goes, I... I just can't comment on birds because I can't spend my whole day defending my comments. And that's exactly right. Ask Nancy yeah. Uh, yeah. a couple of times at Disneyland of all places, I made the mistake of making a comment like that or putting something on someone else's Facebook page, a group's oh, page. Shit. And I had to spend the whole freaking day defending it. Like he said, you know, and, and I get I like, so mad at him. I keep telling him, don't do it. Don't do it. You yeah. know, and so he, I think like I just got tired of it. I go, okay, oh. delete. <laughs> it's uh, I know what you're saying, Kenny, because there, there's times that I've got my phone in my hand and I see something, and especially somebody's commenting about it. Okay, a large group of people's coming, and I'm like, and my brain is saying, "Don't do it, don't do it," and yeah. I want to do it so bad, but I know when I do what it's going to do. So finally, I just throw the phone out of my hand and walk away from it. But it, it's so hard not to do. But it makes me mad. The best to, not to do. It makes me mad at myself that I even did that because I yeah. would have expected that. Um, some people just can't. Frank tells me all the time, even if they ask, don't tell them because they don't want to hear the truth. They want to hear that everything's okay and they're beautiful. And uh, I'm the worst critic of all. So if I see a problem, which I usually see pretty quickly, uh, it comes up and, even my members say that they can't go on other people's farms or go anywhere after being on the Breeders Academy because they see all these faults. It's like a, it's like a blessing and a curse at the same time. It's just like flies out at you, you know. What I've yeah. what I've learned over the time though, Kenny, if they ask me like in a comment or something, and they ask me about it, I will never answer it for people to see. Now I'll send them a private message and discuss it that way, but I because they don't want to see what I'm going to write. Maybe I should have oh, done I, that. I do Maybe a private I, message. Yeah. I never Maybe do I anything. Open I, I just figured he asked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I, 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 hey, you I, told him. Duty. I was already upset, you know, so. Kenny didn't sugarcoat it. No, I never do. <laughs> well, yeah, you guys aren't the only ones because Lori here is saying that she breeds dogs and horses too. And she's learned a long time ago to shut up, but yeah. it's really hard sometimes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she's I mean, right. It, it, right. it just, you look at the birds and you see all these, you see hundreds of people. I can think of one guy. I don't want to say his name. He's a very popular person. And he uses other people's birds to put his tips out and everything. And almost every one of the birds he uses is awful. Okay. And then he gets 300, 400, 500 people saying that he they didn't even read his message. Okay. <laughs> they totally I'm leaving. Message. We just, you know, we just <laughs> you haven't reached out far enough. They, wait a minute. They see the bird. And they, they just think it's the greatest bird ever. And I want so badly to get in there. Well, what about its right tail? What about a squirrel tail? What about it's this and that? Well, he's so stork-legged. But they totally miss it. <laughs> Did I cross the line there, Frank? Yeah. Nah. No, eventually we'll get to everybody. It's it's going to take some time. This is not a race. It's some No, yeah. Time. That's right. Mm -hmm. Ten years from now, we'll get there and get a hold of everybody's neck and shake them. You know, so don't turn do upside down and shake them. It's, you know, me and Kenny's always saying, and, you know, we have good days and bad days. And we'll say, you know, everything's changing. Everybody is seeing the yeah. picture, you know, they're starting to talk the talk, yeah. you know, 
they're, they're starting to uh, post better birds. And then all of a sudden you got those days is like, where did it all go? Well, you know, wh what happened? You know, it's back, you know, it stepped back and then it gets good again. So yeah, it, it comes and goes, but it, it has get better. I have to admit, Kenny, it has get, it's, it's got much better. <laughs> yeah, I'm seeing a trend. It, it is uh, going in the right direction for the most part, I think. And, um, it, if, you know, we teach we teach 10 people. Those 10 people teach 100 people, and it'll just keep mm -hmm. expanding. Steve says it <laughs> just right. Public <laughs> humiliation can be healthy. It's uh, humiliating, but <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, actually, it's frustrating more than anything because I'm just it is. I'm just trying to help them, you know. <laughs> but you know, if they would see it that way, but now I'm gonna tell you something, and and I I, I might not or not say this, but I'm gonna say it, and, and I know Kenny's gonna agree with me, and you guys will too. But people like you, you've got these podcasts where they agree with everybody. You know, they spread uh, stuff that's not true. Yeah, and they'll look at a bird that is nowhere close to even being right confirmationally eat up with defects and they'll say oh that's the best looking bird i've ever seen in my life you're a great breeder you know patting them on the back knowing it's a lie but they do it to get popularity they want people to like them uh kenny somebody asked kenny that kenny tells them the truth well you know he's a butthole you know uh, <laughs> you know he told me my bird sucked you know but you asked him you know uh now if kenny had lied and said oh your birds are great you're an excellent breeder man you're just a bomb he would have been kenny's fa fan still Okay, but you know when Kenny tells the, the truth, they don't. You know what I love about the members, and this helps a lot, actually. So anybody, any of my members listening, it does help me, is when they say, tell me what you think of my birds. Don't sugarcoat it. <laughs> yeah. well, well, that goes along with what George is That's, saying down well, here. He says, not sure about any of you, anybody else, but during my first coaching call with Kenny or Frank, where you... <laughs> Were you hesitant to send him pictures of your birds? I dreaded it. Luckily, Kenny <laughs> didn't roast the pictures. <laughs> you know, don't don't feel that way. I'm on your side, okay? Oh. Now, look at here's how I look at it. Okay. As I I mean, you guys all see the birds I started with. They were awful, okay? Yeah. We all start there. So, when I look at birds, yes, I do look at the faults. I see how bad the faults are. I I examine or i determine what if we can go in, if we go in the right direction can they be created can you create a strain from them okay so then i go from looking at the faults to looking at the possibilities and then i see the hen and cock you are breeding then i decide okay if we do it this way we breed this cock to this hen this is where we go once we get the offspring this is where we're going to go after that once we see that get back to me um I'm not, I understand where you're at. I understand where everybody's at when they're um, um, sending me. In the their, beginning. They want, yeah. So I totally get it. And I'm just trying to help you. I'm not going to say, oh, they're pieces of crap. Get rid of them. I believe, I'm a firm believer that, especially with American games too, I'm, um, I'm still learning a lot about the domestic side. But when it comes to American games, I've been bringing those long enough to know that you can create uh, a strain from any cock and hen. Now, what I will say about the domestic chickens real quick is that I still believe that, but when you're, if you're just taking any cock and hen, a domestic breed, will they be that breed and variety when you're done? That's the question. If not, I still believe you can create a strain, but they're going to be different than what they were. Now, American games, they have so much blood in them, so many different uh, bloodlines put into them. That's why we call them sometimes hybrids, but most of the time we're calling them mo mongrels. But I do believe the strain can be created from any cock and hen that eventually we can get there. The genes are there. We just need to look at the variations as they're expressed and determine whether we want to cull them or we want to breed to them. And then eventually we can get there. I understand the breed that well that we can do something. So don't ever be afraid to, you know, share your birds with me at all. You know, I'm, I'm there to help you completely. And if I, I, I think there's no that we can't get there, then I'll let you know. I don't want you wasting your time or money, you know, for yeah. sure. Well, the thing about it is it's, it's to help you. You have to look at it this way. If we're giving you any type of negativity about the birds, you know, we're not going to say, Oh, that bird's a junk, you know, get rid of it. Well, what we'll do, we'll explain what we see wrong, yeah. why it's wrong. Give yeah. you an idea of it. Try to make you see, you know, what it is that the bird's lacking. 
Yeah. And, you know, a lot of times, Kenny, I don't know about you, there's been a really bunch of nice birds. That yeah, I, lately I, I've been seeing a lot of good I'd birds. I'd be like, wow, man, you, you know, you've got a great start, you know. But I've seen just as many good birds up from the members as I have bad. So a lot of them starting out really, really well. But now a lot of them's invested a lot of money in these birds, too. Yeah, that's the scary part. Yeah. Uh, I think they're thinking I'm going to go in there and go, are you crazy? Those birds suck. You got to get rid of them, man. What do you think you're doing? Those are the worst birds I ever saw in my life. We got to start all over. Get rid of them. You know, what else do you have? No. You know, I'm not going to do that. (laughs) You know, I'm not going to do that. You know, I want to be there one day when you do do that. (laughs) Not on purpose, but as a joke and video it. Video it. And you go, nah, I'm just joking. You got great birds. to them. I know that something like that could be carried way too far. I put on a disguise and join under an alias and, and uh, uh, get a coaching call with Kenny and have a, a guinea and a turkey and say, what do you think? <laughs> that would be a great blooper, you know? That would, that would be an awesome that. trip. I should have yeah. said that now when I set it up. That would have been a good one for it. I had Nancy video it. Exactly. You so, know what, though? The people that um, join the Breeders' Academy and um, only go for three months, because I know there's a there's a package that you can join for three months and then you can renew. I'm thinking that those guys are are selling themselves short because what you start out with in the three months, you know, if you're going through the uh, the oh, it's a long day, the um, founders program. You know, after three months, I think you should do another coaching call with Kenny or Frank and let them see the birds and see how you're progressing or or even after a year or two, how they're progressing and are they on the right track? So, I mean, I I, the question I get a lot of times, if I join, how long do you think I should expect to stay? Yeah. And I honestly say I would plan on staying for like three years because. There's so much information inside the Breeders Academy. There's no way you're going to absorb it in three months. Okay. And we are changing that information or improving or expanding it and making more material all the time. So if you leave, you're going to be missing out there. Okay. So understanding and then, okay, then you really didn't even start breeding them at that point. If you're only in there for three months to really put it to practice and understand that when you get the offspring, what you're going to see. Okay. So I always say plan on staying for like a good three years. You don't need to like absorb it all at one time. You can absorb a little bit at a time. You can do periodic coaching calls. You can see how you're progressing. We're going to be adding videos to most of the material that's already in there and creating new material with videos. Things you come back, if you quit and you came back a year later, you'd be surprised how much more information I'm putting. I'm pretty much in that website almost every day. Okay. So I'm always putting in new material, new information. I'm expanding the stuff that's in there. We're, we're doing all kinds of stuff. And uh, I hear it all the time uh, members will quit and then they'll come back later and they say the same thing. Wow. Things, this website's completely different than it was before. There's so much more information. I love it. I don't, I can't believe I quit, you know? So, and then I do understand that there are some people that were just curious, wanted to get in there and check it out and they're just not breeders. And then after <laughs> looking at the material in there and realizing what it takes to actually create a strain, it's not for them. They're like, well, this is more work than I want to do. I'm not really cut out for this and I'll just continue doing what I do. I'll just cross everything, add new blood all the time, <laughs> you know, but what I'll ends just up happening, waste more what money what ends up happening is that they, after being out for a while, they start realizing what they're missing and everything come back and they, they change their views. But most of the people stay, I still have people in there since what we do start this website about six years ago. I still have people from the very, that's been in there since the beginning. You know, um, the percentage of people that quit compared to the percentage of people that stay, the ones that quit are very low. Um, I'm, I, I mean, I always get more members than I'm losing, so I never worry about that per se. But I, I kind of feel, it's like I feel, how do I say this? I feel sorry for the ones that leave because I go, God, you're really missing out. You're really going to be missing out. Well, because if they saw the list I have of the projects that I'm working on and stuff that I'm going to be adding eventually, uh, you, you'd be surprised. I've got a huge list that I'm constantly working on. Well, I mean, you talked about that. Well, I've told you a bunch of times, just say for instance, that 
we printed off every aspect of the founders program, written it out for them, put it in a little nice binder book, you know, and said, there you go. Don't cost you a dime. You know, it's useless. Yeah. Without the rest of the website, after access, the way it's set up. And I don't think Kenny intended to do this. It's just the way it's laid out. But without the rest of that website and the articles and the literature and, and, and the stuff you need to educate yourself on, Founders Program is awesome put with the website. But if you just got the Founders Program, it's not going to do you any good. And the videos we're creating for the Founders Program are going to make it 100 times better. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm I'm trying not to exaggerate, but I'm telling you, compared to what's already in there and the videos we're producing to further explain it, I mean, the, just from the um, what I'm hearing from the members, it it just made the program so much better. Okay, it's it's like night and day. Um, yes, the material that's in there supports what's in the founders program, so it helps you understand it. But the third element is me and Frank. That we're there all the time to answer your questions because if you get one thing wrong or you do it wrong or there's a question and you're not able to ask that question you could be going in the wrong direction and doing it wrong it's it, i'm not going to say it's a complex program or yeah breeding program it's actually really simple when you look how it's laid out but there's certain things about it that you need to know as you're going down so that you're making the right decision because it's the offspring that tell you what direction to go. The offspring are telling you what you're going to do next. And if you don't do it right, you're going to screw up. And we, you don't have time to screw up. Okay. Um, but um, I, I, I never worry anymore only because when they quit, they come back. <laughs> you know, most of them come back. <laughs> yeah. They do. It's so funny, you know. And I and I always tell my uh, former members, if you want to come back, just get a hold of me. I'll get you in. Even when I have the doors closed, Come back. I'll get you in. I'll get you in at the price you were in before. So because I that was one of the things that some of the members were saying is that I didn't want to pay. I was only paying, you know, $40 before. Now it's up to $50 a month. I didn't want to pay a higher price. You know, was a chance I get the price I had before. I go, let's go. I'll get you in. No problem. You know? Yeah. But the, the biggest thing about that, Kenny, is... And that, that was a good point, you saying that, you know, we were here for them. And it's really goof-proof when you add the three together. It's really goof-proofed. I mean, I told Kenny, I said, if we make it any more simpler to learn and use, we'll be going to their farms and, you know, doing it for them. Yeah. It, it's really laid out. When those which three are too, together. By the way, yeah. which I've actually done, too. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, you have the Founders Program. You got the material that supports it. You've got the masterclass videos that we're producing that helps further explain it. And you have me and Frank to help you, to guide you, to make sure that you're going in the right direction. Okay. And that's What's just that? with a little question. You know, so maybe you're not 100% sure on just one little thing. You know, yeah. you drop me and Kenny a line or we call you up or do a coaching call. which are, Just to answer a question. We're here just to answer one question if needed. If you're not a breeder, I get it. You know. You don't need to be in there if you're not a breeder, if you're not interested in creating strain, or you just don't think you're up to doing it, then I, I get it. But just know that you're always welcome to come back, you know, when you when you leave. What's he saying? What's George saying? Oh, still, yeah, George oh, is Lord, hilarious. He's <laughs> so hilarious. There's too much to learn, and for sure, you won't learn it in three months. I tried but it led to hallucinations from lack of sleep. Then you tend to forget bits here and there. <laughs> yeah. Don't. Yeah. That's so funny. Don't try to absorb this all at one time and don't be afraid or I want to say the word lazy to read some things over and over again. Okay. I'm a big repetitious kind of guy. So when I, I'll read my books here and I'll read a page and I'll say, wow, that was interesting. And I'll read it over again. And then I'll see things I didn't see before. Okay. And the videos too. We we throw so much information into every video we do that if you're only watching it once, you miss most of it. Okay. Yeah. If you've only read the articles one time, or maybe even the founders program, you looked at it one time, you missed most of it. You need to look it over, over and over and over again. Okay. That's how you get it to sink in. I think I've read or listened to everything on there at least five times, probably. 
if not more. Absolutely. But what I do is I go to work, and even though I've read them that many times, if there's nothing else on my podcast or anything, I'll go through just an article, and I'll highlight everything. I hit the button, put my earbuds in, and as I'm working, I listen to it. We're driving, going on a trip somewhere. I put mm -hmm. it on the radio. You know, I, I it's 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 like Kenny said. I have to almost constantly. The more I read it, or the more I listen to it, the more I understand it. Type thing. And I can listen something three or four times and go a while and come back and listen to it again and get something else out of it that I didn't get the other times. It's it's just the way the mind works. We present things in text, pictures, illustrations, video, audio. I try to cover everything, okay? There's some downloadable um, PDFs in there. Um, I have it set up with a start here page so you can just follow along. If you fit like... I always tell people, I don't never want my members to feel lost, frustrated, or confused. If you get to that point, because it, if you just look at the website and you go in there, you're going to be, oh, my God, where do I go? You know, But the start page does get you on the right foot. But if you still feel lost and confused or frustrated, get a hold of Frank and I, and uh, we'll help you out. I never – that's why we do these. The, I'm, I'm telling you, the coaching calls really changed the game. It really did. Once, uh, once we got that, it, it, things got so much better. So he's saying, uh, when is the next enrollment? Next enrollment is uh, March 20th, which is the first day of spring. I'm going to have the doors open for about a week or so. No more than that, you know. So make sure you join. Um, I don't know. We typically open the doors twice a year. Um, so I don't how long, know. Kenny? How long are you going to have the doors open for? Um, Any idea? say 10 days. That's kind of what I'm thinking. Cause we we're opening it on the 20th, 20th, which I think is a Thursday. Close at the end of the month. So it'll be, it'll come around the next Thursday and I'll probably close it the following that weekend after that's what I'll probably do. So probably about 10 days. That's what I would think. But make sure you guys, if you haven't yet sign up for the breeders bulletin. Yeah. That's do that. our newsletter. Uh, you're going to get a lot of information from our breeders bulletin. Just go to, you can see the, the ticker tape, thing at the bottom it's uh www.breedersacademy.com sign up for the breeders bulletin you're going to get all kinds of free information some uh, free ebooks uh some downloadable stuff and there's some opportunities in there too that you uh, want to pay attention to and uh, uh if you don't you know if you if you're getting the emails and you don't like them anymore you can always subs unsubscribe no problem but it's just it's free information for you, and it helps you uh, get prepared for the Breeders Academy. And uh, yeah, definitely do that. Can't a lot of the members that's how they they become members. They started the yeah. the uh, the actual emails, and then once they start getting emails, then they went from the emails on in to to being, becoming a member. This is a trade secret, but I have what I call a funnel. Okay, so most people find me first in Facebook or YouTube. In there, you're going to see posts. They're going to lead you to the Breeders Bulletin, which is our newsletter. So you join the Breeders Bulletin. You get information from there, and that leads you normally to the website. Okay, so the, the social media is the first step. Breeders Bulletin would be the second step, and the Breeders Academy would be the, the final step. Okay. Frank, you get what you tolerate. A lot of people don't realize that. That's true. Well, it's, it's just like, uh, once again, we'll use a chain for, for instance, you know, you've got a real stout chain and then you put a little plastic link in it, you know, guess where it's going to break every time. And it, it's sort of like that with chicken, just like we was talking about disease, illness, sickness, health. Uh, you put one sick bird in, in the mix and even though he's say the total package, got everything, but he's got lousy health. There goes your family down the drain. Uh, you've got a, you can't tolerate. You're only going to be as good as what you tolerate. I guess you could say. And sickness is the biggest uh, defect of all. The, Poor the main, the and main. medications aren't going to get you there. Like they may hide temporarily the symptoms but that doesn't usually get rid of the disease. Very rarely do the medications we have for chickens actually eliminate the disease. 
They'll knock down the symptoms. But if you ever, if you know chickens well enough, you've been breeding them long enough and you've been medicating them, you'll know darn well that those things are chronic, that they will show that disease again and again and again. And another thing, if you're using medications, your genetics in the birds, that the traits that you're, you're choosing from will never reach their full potential regardless of what it is. The bird in a hole will never reach its true potential. That's what got me out of the, on the health gig because without health, the birds that you're, you're breeding will never, ever show true potential ever. Right. Ever. You know, Dr. Gyro was talking to me the other day about um exposure or um symptoms of like uh parasites that a lot of time it's the uh, a poor immune system those are the ones you're going to see the parasites on the lice the mites the worms and things like that okay and a lot of people don't realize that that you start with gut health probiotics things like that feeding them properly making sure they have water making sure they're healthy overall and the ones that are not taking care of their birds properly and they have poor gut health tend to have a really poor immune system. And those are the ones that tend to have, have more sickness and definitely have more parasites because those parasites are drawn to that, you know? So it was, it was interesting the way he said it. Matter of fact, it was in our last show on biosecurity. So make sure to check that out. He yeah, goes, well, he's got it right, Kenny, because if you know anything about birds uh, or let's just say any animal, any species without good, good health, the good health is your immune system. Okay. And if we're shoving down these harmful, harmful chemicals that say wormers, uh, antibiotics, bacterial antibiotics, when we're giving those chickens that it's going in and it's killing the good and the bad. So yeah. it's doing more harm than actually the disease is causing really. And the side effects from a lot of these medicines are worse than the disease. You know, I've seen this many, many times over. Some of these medicines by far have some of the worst side effects than most of your diseases that you're trying to fight. So, uh, you know, Kenny hit it on the head. Cull, like Mother Nature does, yep. don't take anything for granted. If a bird is hat shows any sign of sickness, that's your wink link in your family. Uh, myself, I will never, ever breed a sick bird up. Or a bird that's been sick. Even if he recovers, he'll never be bred. I agree. You know, it's like um, it's like without medications, peddlers wouldn't have any birds to sell because that's how much they rely on the medications. And um, I just wouldn't I wouldn't medicate anything. It's like Frank says, I'd be hiding a weakness, and I don't want that because I'm a breeder. That's how I look at it. I'm a breeder, and I don't want to breed anything that shows. A weakness to anything because it's going to show up in the offspring and uh once i start medicating i'm always going to be medicating but um yeah i, I think that's how peddlers look at it if i don't medicate i won't have none to sell and uh, as long the, as i can get the bird the money for the from the bird and once it gets into the buyer's hand it's his problem you know that's all they need to do is get it well enough to sell it okay so yeah you're right and here's the thing they take the antibiotics it, it masses the bird's illness his faults. The the buyer takes the bird home, okay, a month, two months, or maybe even sooner. The bird gets sick. Hey, you sold me a sick bird. No, it was on your place. It got sick on your place. It it wasn't me. That's the way it always goes because they had it so full of medication and antibiotics. It masked it for a few months, just to what Kenny said, just to get it out of their hands, get the money, and get it on the buyer's place. And then they're, they don't care if it dies, lives, get sick, what? Yeah. Um, we, so ahead. let me ask you this. So what is this guy's gonna, alternative going to be? Quick question for you guys. What do you do with a breeding cock that is plucking his own feathers out? He's been wormed and dusted with seven dust. I've been using ivermectin drops, washing with uh, just soap. That could be a couple of different things. Mm-hmm. Uh, one could be he had parasites, which I'd like to know if he found anything before he dusted him, you know, if, if he had any parasites on him, out external parasite, but it could be a mineral deficient too. Uh, birds, does he have another, is he in with any other chickens or is he just by himself? Cause that would make a big difference. If he's plucking himself 
and he's got like cans in with him, then it may not be uh, a methionine deficiency. Uh, it'd be more of something irritating, I would think. Wouldn't you, Kenny? Yeah, it depends on what feathers he's talking about. He's talking about right. like the tail feathers. Um, first thing that comes to thought is a depluming mite, which the iromectin would have took care of. You know, mm -hmm. it just won't make it look good right away. It's going to take some time, and he may not see a difference until the actual molt. But, yeah, if it's the rest of the body, then I'm looking more towards a problem with nutrition myself. Yeah. So. Hey, well, he's plucking it of feathers, so I'm a thinking that he's probably down on his – around where yeah. you can reach more it could be mites it could be, could be. Uh, mites and lice it could be nutrition if it's the body um yeah it could be anything could be uh, could be actually could be several different things and causing that that could even be a mental you know yeah. uh, a mental situation though. yeah and if it's the only bird doing that then see i would call them yeah you know to me that's a weakness you if know. he didn't have any mites or anything to cause him to do that, then I'm like, I'm with Kenny. There's something, you know, like I say, it could even be a mental defect or some, some sort. Yeah. So sometimes you got to look at the individual, but also t you need to look at uh, the rest of the birds. So oh, sorry, Kenny. It's like, if it's just one bird, then it could be genetic. If it's all the birds, then it could be environment or nutrition. You know, I kind of, break it down like that first so um yeah if it's just one bird i usually call it yeah. i don't but now a lot of times uh methionine deficiency they'll go after feathers because feathers is protein so if the nutrition yeah. if it's lacking in nutrition the feathers is usually the first thing a bird will go after because it's nothing but uh they get the methionine out of the feathers pretty much yeah you know a bird with a defect has the ability to destroy a whole string, Frank. Uh, defects are recessive. Some can be polygenic, depending on which is which. It will depend on how you take care of it, how you either cull or how you move forward from there. Some are even lethal, you know, but I try to call defects. Well, you go back and you look at the, the list, and we talk about this so many times, Kenny, that's inside the Breeders' Academy. And I, I can't remember. There's either 87 or 89. I can't remember the total number, but that's a high number of defects. And what's the chances that people that's never studied uh, defects, what's the chances them going out on their yard tomorrow, going over that chart, going out on their yard tomorrow and not finding one of those defects? Uh, near uh, impossible. Yeah, near impossible. Uh, near near impossible. Time, most time people will see that defects course and I'll get a email or a letter or some kind of a message saying that uh, they were depressed, <laughs> you know, that they end up going out there and killing most of their birds or depopulating their, a good portion of their flock because they didn't realize those defects exist. It's like they started freaking out. They start reading this. They're like, oh, no. Oh, shoot. And they go out there and start realizing that the birds have most of these defects. Mm -hmm. um, but understanding what those defects are is important, like I talked about. Are they recessive? Are they polygenic? Because we're going to deal with those differently depending on whether they're a, a monogenic trait, a polygenic trait, uh, whether they're, you know, dominant recessive or multi-gene trait, whatever. You know, it's like I'm going to handle a polygenic trait differently than I would one that's recessive. And I, it gives me a little more hope. I have a chance of improving the family, fix the family down the road where we're, we're Whereas if they all have a recessive defect, then I have no choice but to call it right away. Uh, look at this, Kitty. I'm not jumping in front of you, Nancy. Steve's got it all figured out. It says, <laughs> my birds only get sick once. That's good. And that, that's me, it. Steve. That's that's me. That's a good motto, man. That, right. Keep that motto. You'll go far. But that, that's a great motto. That is. I'm going to have really. to remember that. I'm going to steal that from you, Steve. That's yeah. a, that's a <laughs> I love that. great phrase. I don't know why I never thought of that. If that, I said that, it, I don't remember. That's me. Yeah, that, that's that is me. They only get sick once and that's it. Yep. That's, that's a good way. That's a good way of thinking. Absolutely. I'm like Tony. I'll help them. I'll help them in their quest. If they want to die, <laughs> I'll help them. There yeah. you go. Yeah. Okay. We're uh, almost at the end here. Um, Frank, every bird that is substandard is a step in the wrong direction. 
Now, a lot of people don't understand how to read a standard. They obviously by looking at the birds we're seeing on social media, I think that's true. <laughs> that they don't really understand what makes up the bird. They don't understand the strip, the structure of the bird, the makeup of the bird. They don't understand what the true type means. I, I don't even think they would know what the word type means, actually. They don't understand the conformation of body. And they I don't think at this point they even know the color. But anything that where we 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 say it anything that's defective, sick or substandard. And being substandard just means that they don't match the standard. They don't match the criteria of that breed and variety. So understanding the standard, understanding what to select for, understanding how to move forward from that is so important. And if you don't understand that, you're just going in the wrong direction and you're just spinning your wheels. And I think that's what my members of the British Academy realized right off the bat when they joined. Well, we mentioned one of them a while ago, which is health. Health and confirmation should be together as one. Yeah, you've got to have those two before you can even start a strain. Mm -hmm. Before I'd even consider making, if those birds don't have that, I don't want nothing. I don't want them. I don't want nothing to do with them. But uh, going to confirmation, Kenny, a lot of people, it's really a lot of people, and I think it's a bigger number, has to train their eye for proper confirmation. I don't think a lot of people, and I was one of those people, I had to train my eye to actually see that the bird's true silhouette confirmation which a lot of people I think are just born with a gift. They can just automatically look at a bird and say, okay, that's the correct confirmation. Um, but they're never going to get there if they keep adding ACL or Peruvian blood into them. Oh, God, no. <laughs> that, that, that's that, why we're losing the breed. We're losing the American that, game breed if we keep doing that. You know? That's going to be a quicker way to destroy the American game. Mm -hmm. You know, American games has come a long way over the years, Kenny. You know, just in the past, 30 years they've kind of they've come a long way just you know they they look more athletic they're more streamlined they're they're just a better looking bird i think yeah but people is adding you know these these other birds to them and it's just that they're not even close those birds are not even close to the mercury game confirmation the way they are supposed to look and what happens when we go back nancy mentioned the uh, silver duck wings what happens when our American uh, American games all look like Hazel or Ooh. provisions. You know, what but, happens then? There's an argument that, that says that they're getting there right now. You know, it's uh, close. Why do we want? <clears throat> I mean, if you want to do that, then raise a Peruvian breed, raise a, um, an a cell breed, and then raise your American games. If you want to do the cross, I get it. Fine. But keep them separate make them distinct you'll get better hybrid vigor it's just, it's yeah. just a better way to go than constantly bringing a new blood if you have a foundation you're constantly adding new blood to what you think is a foundation and then you're spinning your wheels wondering why you're never really yeah. getting there wondering why only a handful of the birds are worth a darn ever you know so uh, we've definitely got to change our way of thinking for sure absolutely but it's an epidemic right now. It really is. You, yep. you you told the truth about that because just go on Facebook and go down and you'll see a large number of birds that doesn't even represent the American game anymore. I know it's scary. Well, Absolutely. that's just like this one. If I, It'll pop up. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who said that? I hope he's joking. My, okay. You know, I'm not... <sighs> I don't have time for that question. <laughs> I, don't, I just don't have time. I do. Okay, go I, I've got it. Because I think I go I've on got forever it. on that one. You you take two peer families <laughs> that's been bred properly, that's a true family, and you make them what you want, and then you put them together. That's your, that, that's your best cross right there. If you want to cross, that's your best cross right there. If you're going to ask me that kind of question, then we're playing the name game, which those names don't exist anymore. Nobody's hatch is the same anymore. Nobody's Kelso. So you can't say a health health, a hatch and a Kelso is a good cross because they don't exist anymore. They're all different. So I it's an impossible thing to tell you. Under thinking that you have half this and half that or three quarter and three quarter uh, quarter of this, which is what we call the percentage game, the percentage of blood game, which genetics doesn't work like that. OK, you can't carry on a bloodline. All you're doing is passing on traits. When you cross two birds, you're either adding traits, a lot of times recessives you didn't want. You're losing dominant, homozygous dominant traits, 
You could be introducing lethals. Okay. You could be losing the intensity of the polygenic traits or losing the polygenic trait completely. So when you're crossing birds, you're not getting what you think you're getting. Okay. And if you're doing multiple crosses and always adding new blood, you went from hybridization to mongrelization. So he tapped into a subject that this, this wasn't supposed to be about. If you want to learn more, go to our shows on crossbreeding. Uh, what else, Frank? Hybrid, uh, crossbreeding um oh i can't remember all the names now but we did a lot of episodes on crossbreeding cross versus appear as uh, a good one the, the mongrelization of a strain if you want to understand what crossbreeding is all about and understanding what that question means to us go watch those shows because that's a show all by itself and if anybody thinks they can answer that question for you they don't know what they're talking about that's right okay there's a that's way to cross right. birds and there's a way not to cross birds. There's a way to get the benefits of crossing and there's a b- way to lose the benefits of crossing. <laughs> George, this is Kenny's <laughs> favorite subject. No, it's not. No, okay? y- y- you know, they this can go back to Nancy, Nancy. This is a peddler's playground. And if they're using those kind of terms, they're typically peddlers because they either don't know what they're talking about or they're deceiving you. Well, you said it though, Kenny, one guy's hatch is not another guy's hatch. Nope. They're going to have totally different traits. One, you know, there's good, there's bad, there's mediocre. Uh, it's, it's not like they all, cause it's a Kelso. I've got a Kelso. Kenny's got a Kelso. They're going to be totally different. Kenny's yeah. may not be worth 10 cents. Mine may be, uh, be <laughs> mediocre or, ju- you know, junk themselves. You never know. Just because it's Kelso and a Kelso don't mean they share the same traits. It's just, it's just how it is. Steve's worrying about my health right now. <laughs> He's saying, I just, he just sent your blood pressure to the moon. You know, I do get worked up over it because it's, it's, it's way, oh God. It's a way of thinking that's um, false for one thing. It's holding people back. Peddler, peddlers use it to act like, to make it look like they know what they're talking about to sell birds. And it's just all a lie. It's all wrong. It just doesn't work. Uh, I would have to disagree with you on that one, George. That's not his favorite subject. <laughs> What's my favorite subject? Cross. Cross well, uh, on the subject. Well, that's what he's talking about, right? Crossing. Yeah. But uh, George asked me if that was, that was your favorite su- subject. Then he asked, Frank, do you agree? And I was like, uh, not, it's not his favorite oh, subject. Oh, not my favorite, yeah. Yeah, not your favorite subject <clears throat> by far. So that's pretty – there's some other topics we could have covered, but we're really – we really Favorite didn't... subject to get his blood pressure up, but oh, yeah, not <laughs> favorite, favorite uh, – Yeah, that'll do it. You know, I just don't like people being misled. And it's just <laughs> – got to get past that kind of stuff or we're never going to move forward. Uh well, it- you know, if you're wondering about that question as well, you can <laughs> you you can listen to the podcast episode on pure versus cross because it explains it pretty well in that one too. It does, yeah, it does. Yeah. That's a good one too. That's a good one. That explains a lot of uh, that explains now, a lot of it. The, the well, old wise tales and stuff too. Most of these are on the podcast. Um, some of these are on YouTube. Uh, the ones that are not on YouTube are on the Breeders Academy archive for our members. So, but almost all the pot, well, not all the YouTubes are podcasts either. So it's, um, to get the way to get it all, everything is to be a member of the Breeders Academy. Yeah. So, so yeah, next time, yeah. what's that? Yeah. Then you'll get all of them. Um, just real quick. Um, yeah. and I can't pronounce his, his name, his, um, uh, uh, anyway, he said that the rooster was by himself, the one that was picking yes. his own feathers, and it, they were wing feathers that he was picking at. Oh. I would say nutrition. It's nutrition, I would say. If he's eating his feather, I've seen a lot of them do that. I've seen uh, a guy uh, go to a cheap pellet uh, one time, and all of his birds, and it wasn't just one, was eating all the, the, the feathers out of the wings and just leaving the veins, and they was just eating them like, the, you know, like they was potato chips. And uh, we fixed his nutrition problem, and and they quit doing it. So that bird, well, if it's not plumage mites, of course, if it's plumage mites, it being he's all over his body, being his wings, his tail, 
you know, so if he's not showing evidence of that before you you dipped him, I would say it's nutritional. Have myself. you ever seen depluming mites in the wing? Nope. I usually see in the tail. Yeah. Just the tail. I've mm -hmm. seen them uh, in the tail and uh, on the some on the saddles, but never n n no farther than that. Never in the wings, ever. I don't know what we're going to do exactly next week, but if we continue this topic, this series that we're doing on breeders um, or multipliers, we're going to talk about the uh, idea of uh, embracing the science of breeding, learning uh, how to embrace all areas of breeding, including including science. I can't talk all of a sudden, uh, which would include proper selection, including confirmation and type genetics and the law of inheritance, evolutionary biology, proper mating methods, proper breeding methods. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that because there's a lot of people out there that are fighting science, trying to discourage science, don't understand science, don't understand the importance of science. And uh, genetics no, don't matter. And a genetics lot of people, don't matter. Yeah. Which, uh, that's, that's crazy. Good. Yeah, that's, that's crazy. crazy. A lot of people just don't like science. Explain yeah, that to a lot of the athletes. You know, we genetics don't matter. Money. We talk about oh, saving yeah. money and time. Man, understanding the genetics makes it speeds up the process. It it shows you which birds you're going to breed, which ones you're not. It's going to show you which one's a coal. I mean, it's not that hard, actually. Once you get a hang of this, I mean, this is what we teach in the Breeders Academy. But once you get a hang of this, it's it's easier than you think it is. It actually learning. Mm -hmm. learning just to uh, learning the necessities on genetics just in a breeding sense i don't mean you've got to be einstein on this stuff okay i mean just learning the basic genetics will make you a god over chickens i'm telling you <laughs> it will yeah you know i'm not talking about making it complicated uh, i actually simplify genetics quite a bit i mean some people can make it so complicated it'll confuse you and you just want to say oh you pull your hair out hair out and don't understand how that all works but we simplify things pretty good. And uh, we, we uh, Grant Brereton, who's a specialist in genetics as far as plumage color and things like that, um, he's still he's just waiting for me. I just got to finish up the outline. I'm going to contact him, get him on, and we're going to talk about uh, genetics a little bit. What's so funny? <laughs> Should no. you play it up? No. no, no, we'll no. On. no I, I, I'm going to let it go. I'm going to yeah, let it go. We're at the that. end. We yeah. can always, uh, take care of it later so we um yeah don't be afraid of science don't be afraid of genetics we're going to talk about that on the next uh, episode of breeders versus uh, multipliers make sure you join our newsletter which is the breeders bulletin there you're going to get free tips free ebooks notifications announcements like the one we've been given to you as far as the opening of the website just go to www.breedersacademy.com to sign up you won't regret it, I promise you. We're going to end the show here. I want to thank everybody for joining me. I want to thank Frank and Nancy for co-hosting the show with me. If I didn't have you guys, I'd be sitting here rambling like an idiot, you know? So it really helps me to have somebody to talk with, to get, take a break, calm down, get my blood pressure where it should be, and not take it out on my listeners and my watchers and my members. And, you know, oh, you, guys, you guys are holding on to my sanity here. So I really appreciate it. You guys have anything you, to say before we wrap it up? I got your back, buddy. You got my back. Oh, oh it, I promise. To not give you too many honeydew lists so that you can work on the website next week. Because I'm on because I'm on vacation next week. So I, I promise to leave you alone. I got a lot of work. My oh, members yeah. depend on me. I got a lot of stuff I'm gonna be putting on the website for them here pretty soon. Well, he's got you a treat coming up too, Nancy. So on your vacation. Oh, yeah. so. well, she knows about it. So it's not yeah. a oh, okay. I know about it. Disneyland. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I promise. Get you a little break. break. We got to get away yep. sometimes, right? I got, I can't work. I can't right. be a total workaholic. So, so anyway, he'll, we'll, he'll go cuckoo. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so we'll see you guys next week. Thanks for jo thanks for joining us, and I appreciate it. Talk to you guys later. See you guys. Bye.
Welcome to the after show. This is the part of the show that doesn't exist. What happens in the after show stays in the after show. If you've mentioned to your friends about the after show, which happens from time to time, no worries. Just tell them not to let out our little secret area of the show. Enjoy. What a great show. We did good. I, I'm no really happy with the way that came. The members were, or we had a lot of comments and questions. George Cruz was uh, at his <laughs> best, and that was it too, you know? So I'm really pleased. You know, you know, George, we yeah. got to meet him sometime. I can't wait I, to well, meet I've done this a coaching guy. call with him. I should have introduced you to him. He's oh, yeah. this guy. But um, he's funnier on the comments there than he was in person. But I think he was maybe a little <laughs> nervous. Who knows? But, uh, you know, Frank, we're so talking about the other day how um, – um, how do I put this? How some people, okay. We were, I was talking about how you became my co-host and how blessed we are and how that all worked out. And it was like, it was like um, certain th- events that all the dots had to connect to make it happen. Kind of. It's amazing that we're even doing this together when you think about it. But I was thinking about how, um, how lucky I actually was because we forgot to mention that, you were a member for a while, but somehow, accidentally, you got canceled. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't cancel you or nothing, but somehow it dropped you as a member. It booted me. Yeah. yeah. And if you wouldn't have rejoined and became a member again, this would have never Ooh. happened. You know, that I could have lost you right there and said, oh, okay, I guess my thing ran out. I'm, I guess I won't be a member. Maybe I'll do it someday. Maybe I won't, you know, but you joined again. Well, and- he's not stupid. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I went, you know, I went in. And I'd been on there for, you know, quite a while. And all of a sudden I went to, to, to log in and it said, you know, more or less tell me I wasn't a member anymore. And I was like, well, you know, maybe I've got to redo it after a certain length of time, you know? So, you know, I got my credit card back out and boom, 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 went in and Kenny said, uh, I, I think I commented on something and I said, uh, yeah, I renewed my subscription today. And Kenny asked me later on, said, I, you know, I meant to ask you about that. I saw that. I don't know what happened, but you know, it just, uh, I don't know, like I'd uh, finished my part and canceled me out. So yeah, you're right. I wonder how often that happens where somebody gets kicked off for whatever reason, who knows? You know, that was the only time though, at one time and it, you know, it never done it again. It was well, just that one time. A few people where they right. said, ah, what happened? I lost my membership or something like that. Oh, let's get you back in. No problem. We'll get you right back in. Um, so I don't know. I mean, the few people that told me that it happened, we fixed it. No problem. But I kind of wonder how many people that happened to and just said, oh, okay, I'll deal with that later. And they never rejoined, you That's know, which is, which is sad because. Kenny must not want me on there. He booted me off the <laughs> side. <laughs> hey, it's electronics. It's the internet. Who knows what happens? You know what I mean? It's PayPal. It's, you know, I've, I haven't had any serious problems with PayPal. Overall, PayPal has been pretty good for me. I know they have their issues and some people complain about them, but it's, but it's runs pretty smoothly for me. I've never seen any real issues or nothing. Um, so I just, hey, keep, I keep working with it. It's 10 times oh. better than the uh, Texas A&M online. That thing is constantly messed up constantly messed up to where I can't, you know, I, I plan out a certain length of time to go in and do my work and it's always server down. It not working or this is not working or I can't log into a certain part of it. Yeah. With, with yours, you compared to it, you have no problems whatsoever compared to it. You know, I know I just re-signed up BSA writer. Um, I didn't know he got kicked off like that. I, or did he tell me that? I can't remember now. But he's saying that happened to him too. I knew I knew he had to get re-signed up. And uh God, I, if anybody's listening to this right now and that happened to you, let me know. We'll get you back in, you know. And I'll make sure you get the price you had before, no problem. I don't have a problem with that whatsoever. But I hate to see people get kicked out like that because you just never know what's gonna happen. I mean, like I said, we're dealing with you know, I've got the website. Everything seems, for the most part, to w- run pretty smoothly. But you know, servers have their issues. I've had the website go down a couple times. I had to call up my server and say, "Hey, what's going on?" They fix it. Boom, it was back up, no problem. Uh, I've had members say, "Hey, is your site down?" I go, "Ooh, is it really?" <laughs> so I go and check it out. I go, "Hey, what's going on here?" Oh, we had a problem over here. It'll be back up in about five minutes. Boom, there it is. And who knows, you know? So, anytime there's an issue with the website. 
or their membership. I hope they get a hold of me and we'll we'll get it fixed right away. I've got I told Nancy uh, one time that I've gotten real obviously I built the website and everything, but I've never considered myself a tech guy, you know. But sometimes people will call me, hey, I got an issue with this, got an issue with my payment, I need to redo my car. They always come up with different things. I feel like I'm like customer service or tech guy. They come in and they call and say, and I'm able to go in there and fix it. Yeah, you're getting really good at it. I'm really good at that stuff. You know, I've, I don't have to have, like some people I know, I don't have to have a webmaster. I don't have to go to someone and say, hey, I'm having a problem with my website. I'm able to, so far, I'm able to fix everything that is, there's been a problem with i've been able to fix all the problems with the membership and uh the payment plans and things like that i'm able to add things when i want to fix it change it whatever i've been able to do all that you know i forgot about that though kenny uh, about that booting me out like that at that time i'd have totally forgotten about that i was out there feeding the chickens when i was thinking about it because i was listening to our show sometimes the next day i'll listen to our show and see how it went because it's hard to tell by being in it you know yeah. we're, right. we're actually performing in it we're talking and then i want to hear it the next day and sound, see how much of an idiot that i sound like you know <laughs> did i say things intelligently or did it sound like a total idiot you know? i hardly ever listen to him kenny's like uh, did you really listen to the show and i'm like no not yet i i've burst unless it's something i want to go back on and see how big an idiot i did sound like i i don't i don't usually go back and listen to him i don't Frank, you do never sound like an yeah, idiot. So. Great. You do you do great. Um, hey, no check, check this out, guys. I, I know we've probably done answered questions for it, but <laughs> now check this out. Okay. What inspired a new look? The temperature was what actually inspired it, but check this out. <clears throat> what? The, the arc. arc. Oh, oh. <laughs> Moses. He did, Good yeah. one, George. Yeah, yeah. yeah but he didn't want, yeah. He goes, he didn't want the beard to drag him down underwater. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a good one, George. <laughs> I love that picture that Kenny made of you. Hey, it's I good. I love it. Yeah. It was good. Man, I got a kick out of that. Tony and I thought about it um, at, when we were at Disneyland in line. I don't know how it came up, but her and I, we always do that. We pass things back. We just like tag your it, tag your it, tag your it. We take, we tell jokes and we just crack each other up. It's like, who can be the funniest kind of thing? You know, and we come up with this stuff. We just crack each other up. We have people around us laughing too. You know, it's, it's uh, kind of incredible. But uh, we come up with really good ideas, Tani and I, just by talking. I mean, that's I bring I my I bring my uh, earbuds just in case. And there are days when we listen to our earbuds and I listen to podcasts. But a lot of times, her and I do the line. We talk all the way through, all all kinds of stuff, you know. And I come up with some great ideas from that. You she's know? a smart kid. Yeah, maybe too smart. Well, she's not. She's me. not a kid anymore. I guess yeah, she's yeah. A, a young adult. Yeah. Those yeah. are the times when they go by themselves and I'm not there. Cause usually when I'm there, Kenny's talking to me and Tani's sitting there with her earbuds. No, here's what happens is Nancy and Tani will do a lot of talking. I try to oh, fight my way into a conversation with Nancy, <laughs> which pisses Tani off. So it's like a tug of war between Tani and I with Nancy and uh, who's going to get most of Nancy's attention. That's how it uh, usually works. You know, they live at the animal yeah. park. They live. That well, that's where we get our exercise. Summer. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. And that, that's good for you. You know, that's good just being out of the house. You know? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. You know, you stay at the house all the time. I would go crazy. Yeah. If I was stuck in the house, I would I would lose it. I really would. But it's nice to be able to get out like that. It is. Kenny, I was knocked out yeah. of my membership yesterday. Okay. Really? Mm. Um, Speaking of the devil. I mean, that, that could be something, Kenny. Yeah. What do I do about that? Oh, I, I'm, as far as letting members know, I got to think of something about that. Okay. So wow. email me, Jesse, and uh, remind me. Um, I just don't, don't put it here, but email me, give me your um, email address. Let me see. Might okay. be a good thing you brought that up, bud. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Here's what we do, Jesse. Contact me, email me. I'll give you a link. To the sign up just let me know how much you were paying before and i'll give you a link so you can sign up and we'll get you back in hmm yeah and i'll remind him too tomorrow did you hear did he hear from you no well, i check my emails often so just email me readers academy yeah. at gmail.com and um we'll get you signed up uh it may be the email doing it i don't think so um, that's odd but yeah, that, lot, okay. A lot of times, 
most of the time when we do the, we check it out. It's the payment card, um, like it expired, things like that. Um, you need it to update your payment card. A lot of times that's what it is. Um, if it's just, you know, just all of a sudden just kicking you off, I can't figure out why that would do that. It doesn't, doesn't happen very often. I don't lose very many members, but I do remember seeing his cancellation um, the other day. Okay. So, um, yeah, contact me, send me an email. Um, I'll give you a link and you can sign right back up. I'll make sure you get the price you had before. But I just need you to sign up right away when you let me know because we'll have to we'll have to coordinate it because um, I have it set up. It, what's the matter, Nancy? I, I hate that smile. <laughs> <laughs> because I know I know what's going what's going to happen. You you've got to open up the site for yeah, an site. hour or two. And no, I can't do. I got to do it as, um, as soon as possible because the way it is right now is, and I'm sure a lot of people aren't listening. This is kind of the inside secret is in my email campaign when you join the breeders bulletin every now and then you might get a um, invitation to join now i need so it's set at a price for me to change it to your price i have to go in change it give you the link you sign up and then i change it back for the people because yes this is a secret now, everybody. So, <laughs> if this is your this is your cue, join the Breeders Bulletin our I, newsletter. What? I guess I need to schedule my appointments for next week. Then, if you're going to open it back up for a few minutes, <laughs> here we go again. <laughs> here we go again. Only some people are going to hear this. Join the Breeders Bulletin. If you're not a member, you're going to at one point get an invitation. Take advantage of it. That's all I'm saying. Other than that, the website's closed until a specific day. I hope that made sense. But for, <laughs> for Jesse, email me. I know I'm going to repeat this. I want to make sure I get this clear. Email me. Let me know when you're ready to sign up again. I'll change the price for you so you get the price you had before. Then I'll change it back. And if some lucky guy happens to open that link that I was just talking about and happens to be a low price, he got lucky. <laughs> he got lucky. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. usually happen. It doesn't usually yeah, happen. That week. Do that. <laughs> <laughs> that there, even though we have the website closed, and this is for the people that decide to hang on till the end, even though the, we have the website closed, there are some back doors into the website, and some people take advantage of it. Yep. Yeah. So. Anyways, I'm looking forward to next week. It's gonna, or if we do the uh, continue the breeders versus multipliers. It's going to be a really good episode on science and embracing the science. I'm looking forward to that. This should be fun. Yeah. Anyways, we'll call it, uh, this will be the real end. We'll end the <laughs> show and we'll see you guys next week. Thanks a lot, guys. All right. Bye. Bring it in there.